To ensure the meeting runs smoothly, if the whip has not provided me with your name and you wish to speak, please raise your hand and wait until I call upon you. If you wish to raise a point understanding orders, please raise your hand and I will invite you to speak at a suitable point. When called to speak, please state the standing order you wish to use. Please wait patiently and do not interrupt the person speaking. If you wish to raise a point of order or personal exp explanation, you may interrupt the councillor speaking. However, please ensure your points are factual, brief and to the point. For councillors joining on Zoom, please keep your microphone muted unless you are speaking. I also ask members to keep their speeches within the five minute limit. There will be a timer in operation. Please remember that when the traffic light is on amber, you have less than one minute to speak. When it turns red, please stop your speech. I would also like to remind members that it is customary if you are able to, to stand when speaking. This is so everyone can, you can be clearly heard and seen. If you are watching at home and would like to follow along with the agenda, there is a link in the description on YouTube. Fire alarm instructions. <laughs> if the fire alarm sounds, please leave the meeting in an orderly fashion by the nearest exit, which is in the lift lobby and down the stairs. Don't use the lifts and don't stay behind to collect personal belongings. Officers will direct you to the assembly point in Shortlands Road. If you can't use the stairs, officers will escort you to a refuge area. The meeting will be taken as adjourned until it can be safely, until we can safely resume business. Item one, apologies for absence. Apologies for absence have been received by Councillor Sally Taylor, Councillor Max Schmid, Councillor Andrew Jones has sent apologies for lateness. Also Councillor Amanda Lloyd-Harris has apologized for absence and Councillor Laura Jaynes. Councillor Patricia Quigley and Councillor Anne Rosenberg are attending remotely. Item two, declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest? Yes, Councillor. Um, Thank you, Mayor. Just to say that for it's not a declaration of interest, but um, for personal work reasons, I'll be leaving the meeting during special motions three and seven, and we'd be grateful if that could be recorded in the minutes. Yes. Yes, Councillor. Okay. Yes. Uh, same declaration as Councillor Alford. Um, just for special motion two, uh, Mayor, I reside in a property, the freeholder of which is uh, the council. Um, I don't intend to leave the meeting for that. Though. Okay. Um, for something special motion uh, to, um, I'm a director of a company which holds a number of uh, Hamsel and Fulham results, but I don't intend to leave the room. Thank you. Item three, minutes. It is the wish of the council that I sign the minutes of the meeting held on the 19th of October. Yes, sorry. Um, Madam Mayor, just to say that uh, similar to what I just said, um, at the previous meeting, I left the meeting for items five and six and asked for that to be recorded in the minutes, but it hasn't been. So I'd be grateful if that it can be updated. Can be yes. With that amendment, um, is it the wish of the council that I sign the minutes of the meeting? Agreed. Item four. It is with great sadness that we note the death of Honorary Freeman George Cohen, MBE, who passed away on the 23rd of December 2022. I would invite the leader, Councillor Stephen Cowan, to say a few words. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mayor. Um, it is indeed with great sadness that George Cohen, one of the remaining 1966 England World uh, Cup champions, um, uh, passed away and it, that, um, that that sadness is amplified and made all the deeper by the fact that many of us in this chamber came to know George as a champion for Hammersmith and Fulham and as he really said Fulham um, as a young boy he grew up in Fulham he uh, joked with me when I met him when we gave him freedom of the borough that uh, when he moved from the house that he he'd, he'd been born into to burn Jones house on the West Kensington estate that uh, he thought the residents were posh because all the children had shoes. And I guess that story in itself indicates the background that someone would come from, but is also a historical snapshot of what it was for working class people in Fulham not too long ago. George, when he um, was given the freedom of the borough, gave an extremely moving speech about his wife, Daphne, who had helped him through the cancer that had been a challenge for him 
prior to his status as a free person of Hammersmith and Fulham. And at the time we did that, it was the 50th anniversary of the England World Cup success. And uh, indeed, it was just before his 77th birthday. George Best described George Cohen as the best fullback he ever played against. And football is the national sport that brings our nation together um, and provides the material to chatter that forms the social life of much of our way of life. But the fact is, George Cohen was much more than an ex England football player, ex Fulham football player. He was a kid who came from a poor background and went on to conquer the world. He was a kid who came from Fulham and never stopped loving Fulham throughout his life. And he was a kid who came from Fulham, who won the World Cup, but then dedicated much of his time to cancer charities and to campaigning against dementia, something that blights many people's lives in later life. George Cohen wasn't just a footballing hero, he was a Hammersmith and Fulham hero, and a hero proud of England. And so to that point, we mourn his passing, send our deepest condolences and grief to his family, and I think look back on his life with pride that he was a Hammersmith and Fulham boy made good. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak on this item? Yes, Councillor. Uh, thank you, thank you, Madam Mayor. And I'd like to echo the, the words of uh, uh, the leader of the council. I, I too uh, got the opportunity when he received his long overdue freedom of the borough to talk to him for a few minutes in the, in the mayor's parlor in the old Hammersmith Town Hall. And you could not have found a hero who was more down to earth and willing to speak to anyone and joke with them and totally pay uh, all their attention to the person he was speaking to rather than a lot of celebrities it's sad to say I think we can all know them that are constantly looking over their shoulder and looking for somebody more important to speak to. George made 459 appearances I think for Fulham and Unlike uh, other players in the modern era, he spent his entire career at Fulham. As the leader noted, he was a Fulham boy and he remained a Fulham boy. And in today's febrile transfer market, there are very few players who spend their entire career at one club. But he didn't just spend his playing career at Fulham. In his autobiography, he mentioned how, as a young lad, uh, he used to climb a tree on the edge of Craven Cottage so he could watch the match for free. Uh, those are the days. Um, but um, before he became a fullback, um, as, as a Conservative, can I just say that I'm, I'm grateful to note that he was a right back as opposed to a left back. But we on this side mourn his passing and send our deepest sympathies uh, to his family. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Are there any other speakers? I would like to propose then that we all observe a minute's silence in his memory.
Item five. I'd like to thank all the residents who took the time to submit questions to tonight's meeting. Public question time is limited to 20 minutes. If a question does not receive a reply in the meeting, a written response will be sent and published in the minutes. All of the questioners called will have an opportunity to ask one brief follow-up question. I would now invite Casey Aberoni to ask his question to Councillor Wesley Harcourt, Cabinet Member for Climate Change and Ecology. Please, can you read your question? About the question. Um, yeah. question. Apologies, it would have helped if I actually knew what my question was. Um, <laughs> Are you able to ask a question? Or? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I would like to thank the council for its approach to cleaning the uh, the environment with clean air neighborhoods. It's an approach which we deem entirely required, completely timely, and very forthright. I would like to ask then, given the support um, given the support and the direction that this requires and the overall position the overall needs that it encompasses and given the fact that 60 uh, that roughly 50 to 60 percent of all of our pollution in this uh, our co2 in the borough comes from transport what is the overarching transport strategy thank you i would now invite the cabinet member to provide a response. Oh, sorry, Councillor Sharon Holder to provide a response. Thank you very much indeed, Mayor. Uh, and thank you, Casey, for the compliments. Um, in terms of the council's transport plan, <clears throat> it, it, this is set out in the second local implementation plan uh, for 2019-2041. Um, this outlines the borough's transport objectives and delivery plan. Um, the recently approved Clean Air Neighbourhoods program is a borough-wide initiative which seeks to integrate work streams from across the council, including the transport plan, to deliver what we believe is an ambitious program over 14 areas over the next two years. The outline program was agreed by Cabinet in November 2022, which has been further developed with a phased approach to the delivery process. At its heart, um, the Clean Air Neighbourhood Program is a comprehensive public health initiative with the um, with the combination, sorry, with the ambition, sorry of reducing many of the impacts of poor air quality and improving the health of residents. During the first phase of developing clean air neighborhoods, the council will seek to make many neighborhood level public realm improvements, including, but not limited to, introducing additional street trees and greening with native species to encourage biodiversity, flood mitigation measures, parklets, pocket parks, reducing the impact of out of borough traffic initially on an experimental basis, consideration for reducing the air quality impact of uh, PM 2.5 emissions from wood burning stoves, localized walking and cycling improvements, tackling energy and heating demand. The approach um, will enable us to deliver a more holistic transport strategy for the borough and work towards our goal of achieving net zero carbon from travel transport by 2030. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up question? I do. Um, re recent consultations and announcements have shown a direction which um, seeks to 
ban or restrict the use of electric cycles or micro mobility, assisted mobility on the Thames path at the same time as reducing the cost of parking within the borough. If the clean air neighborhoods approach is successful, it will enable as one of its um, downsides, easier intra borough driving. With reduced or almost free, particularly if, if the electric cars um, co uh, coming for they will all be free. With reduced or free parking, restriction of assisted micromobility, is this not contradictory to the aims of reducing motorized traffic? Um, Casey, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think, and neither do my team, believe that it's contradictory. However, this is actually not my piece of work. And I will, if you're happy with that, I will get a written re um, response um, prepared for you. And my colleagues will send that to you after this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. I would now invite Caroline Schiffrey to ask her question to Councillor Sharon Holder. Please, can you read your question? Um, Madam Mayor, before I ask my question, am I permitted just a very brief statement to say why I'm asking this question? I can only You've answer. submitted a question. It, um, That's all the only I can do. Okay. Please read your question. Despite the measures that the council have put in place, residents continue to be dropped away from their homes by Uber and minicab drivers, leaving women to walk home in the dark late at night and the frail elderly or disabled residents in difficulty struggling to get home. Local minicab firms who are supposedly registered with the council send vehicles that are not allowed through the cameras. All private hire vehicles are licensed by Transport for London. Why is it not possible for London Borough of Hammersmith to um, use the downloaded AMPR data from the database to interrogate the, the TFL um, database to allow all private hire vehicles to cross the panel to cross the cameras without penalty. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mashufri. Um, I'm grateful to you for the questions and for raising concerns about local minicab firms who are registered with the council sending vehicles that are not exempt. This should not be happening, if I'm going to be truthful, and I have asked the Clean Air Neighbourhood team to contact these local firms and fully update their vehicle details with our systems. Black cabs continue to be exempt with regard to the ride-hailing firms. We are pleased that Uber and Bolt have recently upgraded their sat-nav systems, uh, but appreciate there is more work to be done to educate drivers. We are meeting with those companies regularly and urging them to adopt a technical solution which would automatically exempt those vehicles doing pickups and drop-offs in South Fulham. We have also made it clear that any of these drivers who receive penalty charge notices will be entitled to have those fines rescinded on providing the evidence of their trip involving local residents. We cannot give blanket access to all private hire vehicles as they account for a large proportion of the out of borough traffic that uses, sorry, that use residential streets as cut throughs. And to do so would only wholly undermine our clean air ambitions. Thank you. Do you have a follow up question? Yes, I have a follow up question. Um, we asked a question under the freedom, uh, freedom of information question. It was number 603 0299. 
and the question asked for up-to-date information on the number of camera finds in Sands End East as close as possible to date. Um, we asked for this information in a financial form rather than just numbers, because with the numbers that we have, we're having to estimate how large the fines are. Despite repeated requests, we only have information um, to March 22, and um, with the, the council officers have now gone quiet on us. Um, my question is, the council are making it very clear in their uh, newsletters that they're sending out that the clean air neighborhoods are not about making money from camera fines. Why is it then that they are so shy in producing this information or allowing us to see this information? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm going to be honest, again, I'm not prepared for this question today and I don't have the figures or the information that you've requested, Caroline, in front of me, but I am more than happy to take the question away, which has already been recorded, and we will put that in writing and I will insist that you get it formally in writing uh, from us. In terms of... Um, in terms of the clean air neighbourhoods, sorry, that last bit you said, just repeat that for me again. Well, the, for, la the last I... point is that um, I've been, obviously, as you know, avidly reading the literature that you produce about yeah, clean air neighbourhoods, and you have made statements and making it very clear that your initiatives have nothing to do or are not motivated by making money from fines. And that is the reason why I am asking this question, because it seems to me that there's been huge amounts of money earned from fines. And not only is there a lot of money that the councils were earning, which is one of the uh, complaints with residents, it's also very, uh, it looks like the number of fines are going up and up, um, which is not a sign of a successful scheme. Thank okay, you. well, well, the, the question part to your uh, speech, <laughs> I'm more than happy to answer, <laughs> which in fact, the scheme was launched on the 1st of August, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Yeah. Um, and if there's anyone in this room that can demonstrate for me one person that's been fined, I would be happy to give them the money myself at my purse because no one has been fined. And if this was a money-making exercise, I can assure you that would have happened from day one because the number of people to catch going through the cameras would have taken place, the significant number of people would have been now, and we haven't done. What we've simply done is told people, you've gone through a camera and warned them and said, please make sure you don't do this in future. And what you can do is to go in and go out of that section of the borough, either from Wanterbrig Road or New Kings Road, and there will be no problems with the cameras. So. Again. Oh, sorry, that's not. I'm afraid uh, uh, there's no time yeah, for further exactly. further questions. Thank you very much, Catherine. The residents who submitted questions three, four, and five were sadly not able to attend tonight, so they will receive written responses. And that brings us to the end of public questions. Item six: committee reports. We will now move on to the decision reports. Just a reminder, only those in the chamber can speak and vote on them. Item 6.1, Council Tax Support Scheme 2023-24. I call upon the Cabinet Member for Finance and Reform, Councillor Rowan Reed, to move the report and recommendations. Uh, formally moved. I would now invite Councillor Reed to speak. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the staff in the Revenue and Benefits team. Over the last few months, I've worked closely with them to support residents through the cost of living crisis. Despite increasingly difficult financial constraints uh, and at a time when their workload has gone through the roof, they have managed to sustain a hugely important support mechanism for so many people across this borough. I wanted to speak on this report rather than just formally move it, uh, because in Hammersmith and Fulham, we have one of the most generous council tax support schemes in the country. This generosity, makes a highly regressive tax more progressive, and this would not be possible without a Labour administration here in Hammersmith and Fulham. 
We are rightly proud as having one of the lowest council tax rates in the country, but we are just as proud to have one of the country's most substantial council tax support schemes. Just 53% of properties in the borough pay the full rate of council tax. This means almost half pay a reduced rate or pay nothing at all. During a cost of living crisis, this is more important than ever. Under this scheme, the elderly, those on benefits or low incomes, care leavers, students, those without the means to pay are given the support that they so desperately need. What is more, the most vulnerable members of our community pay nothing at all. And we are one of only 34 councils across the country able to offer this. With the government slashing support uh, for council tax support, councils have had to introduce minimum payments uh, for residents. Now, during a cost of living crisis, we've been determined to avoid doing this here in Hammersmith and Fulham to protect those who are least able to pay. I'm proud that we have done this and this will remain our priority. Now, council tax is a regressive and archaic tax. It takes no account of a resident's ability to pay. Uh, a band H property pays just three times the amount uh, of a band uh, A property, despite supposedly being worth at least eight times as much. And the bandings themselves, they're based on property valuations from 31 years ago. The IFS has said council tax is out of date, arbitrary and highly regressive. It is ripe for reform. Now, we can't reform council tax here in Hammersmith and Fulham, but through this scheme, which supports those least able to pay, we can make it more progressive. By reducing the burden on those suffering most and taking some of them out of paying completely, we create a system in which those with the broadest shoulders can support those who need it. 13,242 households in our borough who would otherwise struggle to pay their council tax are supported through this scheme. Now, farcically, at Cabinet last week, the leader of the opposition tried to claim credit for protecting this vital support in our borough. But let me give her a brief history lesson. Council tax support was previously provided by central government. This stopped in 2012 when Eric Pickles gave councils a grant to provide the support themselves. Now, when the party opposite were running this council, the grant fully funded the default scheme. Since then, the revenue support grant has been cut by 55% in real terms. It was the Conservative Party who took away central government funding for council tax support. It's the Conservative Party who year after year have asked councils to increase council tax by the maximum amount to maintain spending levels. And it is the Conservative Party who have cut funding for council tax support to the bone. Mayor, you cannot trust the Tories with council tax support. This administration has found nearly eight million pounds to protect the lowest income families in our borough. Residents can judge us by this record, and they can judge the Conservative Party by theirs. This scheme only exists in this form because we have made it a priority. It shows a Labour administration fighting for those who need us most. It shows those who are struggling that we are on their side. It shows Labour values in action, and I commend it to the Council. Thank you very much. I would now invite Councillor Daly to speak. Thank you. I have a question, Mayor. I would like to ask, why do we even have council tax? Why do we need to tax household income that has already been fairly and proportionally taxed through PAYE and self-assessment? 95% of all tax revenue in this country is controlled centrally and look at where we are now. Failing healthcare on an unprecedented scale, living standards and free fall, an economy flip-flopping between stagnation and recession. Um, sorry. A government all out of ideas, a laptop all out of energy, <laughs> and a population fearing for their quality of life and financial security. It didn't have to be this way. Our government has a far higher concentration of fiscal power than any comparable country. And there is no reason at all why local government services shouldn't be funded by fair and proportionate taxation. In truth, during the last Labour government, many services were funded in just that way. But the income source from central government has only been going in one direction since. And this borough now receives just 44 pence for every one pound 
it received under Gordon Brown. The shortfall must be collected through council taxation. Two months ago, at the end of a year that marked the deepest drop in household income for a century, the latest in a sorry line of out of touch Tory count, uh, chancellors announced that councils could increase council tax by 5%, effectively pushing the tax burden to local authorities. So this is a coward's tax plan. Instead of raising income by taxing unplanned windfall profits, billionaires, non-doms, global corporations, the pennies are again being pinched out of the pockets of hardworking families and from what's left of our ravaged disposable income. And make no mistake, as Councillor Ree says, it is a regressive tax. It's capped at the top, so the obligation for many in the top band is negligible. Its significance increases as affluence reduces. Sunak and Gove have decreed that those on the lowest pay will have to shoulder the highest proportion of tax increases. Now, in England, Half of all households relying on food banks are in debt to the government. And I don't want to confuse correlation with causation. I'll be really clear here. Government and council debt, uh, tax debt are classed as priority debts and they push people into destitution. Government debt is a recognized cause of poverty. To attempt to mitigate the systemic unfairness of the council tax system, there used to be council tax benefits for low income households, and this was abolished 10 years ago by the Tories. We are now the last line of defence. All councils have a council tax support scheme and all councils have a degree of discretion over who benefits and by how much. Our scheme here in Hammersmith and Fulham seeks to help over 13,000 households, of which 8,500 working age households do not qualify for reduction from any central government pots. And so the question at the heart of this report, should we implement the devolved austerity we've been handed by this government and turn our backs on our most vulnerable households, or should we commit to continuing to support them? We have the power here to rebalance some of those injustices rained down from Westminster, to stand up for our residents and protect them from more increases in the cost of living. And if there was ever a time to stand fast and protect low-income households, now is that time. Now is not the time to make changes. Now is the time to offer all the support we can muster. Mayor, I would ask all councillors here this evening to accept this recommendation and agree to continue this essential support scheme in its current form. Are there any other speakers on this report? Is the report and its recommendations agreed? The recommendations are carried. We now move to item 6.2, Council Tax Base and Collection 2023-2024 and the Delegation of Business Rates Estimate. I call upon the Cabinet Member for Finance and Reform, Councillor Rowan Ree, to move the report and recommendations. Uh, formally moved. And I invite Councillor Ree to speak. No? Are there any speakers on this report? Is the report and its recommendations agreed? The recommendations are carried. Item 6.3, review of the constitution. I call upon the cabinet member for finance and reform, Councillor Rowan Ree, to move the report and recommendations. Formally moved. Are there any speakers on this report? Is the report and its recommendations agreed? The recommendations are carried. Item 6.4, Council Calendar of Meetings. I call upon Councillor Rowan Ree to remove the report and recommendations. Formally moved. Are there any speakers on this report? Is the report and its recommendations agreed? The recommendations are carried. Um, Mayor, understanding order number 15, paragraph E3, I now ask that the special motions listed in the agenda be taken in the following order. Three, four, five, six, seven, one, two. Okay. 
Is that seconded? Formally seconded. Is this agreed? We can now put it to a vote. All those in favour? Those against? And those not voting? That's carried. We can now move to item 7.3, special motion three, Liz Truss. I call on Councillor Trey and Councillor Gwobi to move and second. Formally seconded. I would now call on Councillor Trey to speak for the administration. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Firstly, as this is my maiden speech, I'd like to thank the residents of Wormholt for voting for me. It's the greatest honour to serve them. Um, I am proud also to be following in the remarkable footsteps of three extraordinary servants of our borough. Max Schmidt, still my wonderful fellow ward councillor. Sue McMillan, who led a radical change and brought record investment to our education and children's services and was a champion for her constituents. And the late, great Colin Ahern, who was a true local hero and the very definition of public service. I was, I was raised in a working class household in the north of the borough. My parents both worked full time. We were relatively poor, but we got by. There was an al almost enough food just, sometimes enough money for a treat, but not often. But what we did have was hope. I'm of a, the generation that largely benefited and prospered from the post-war social democratic consensus, a generation that can look back and say thank you to our parents for bringing us a better world with better opportunities built on shared hopes and values. I like to think I've done okay. The education opportunities I had led to university and I forged a successful career in media. Although I spent far too many years in the Daily Mail for anyone's sanity. Um, sadly, as we look around at the society we are passing down to our children, those values and aspirations appear to be from a long lost era. Britain's schools are in a daily fight to deliver a decent education. Our health service is on its knees. This is the price we are paying for 13 years of conservative government. This is the price of 13 years of torturous austerity and downward wage spirals. Food inflation is at 13%. Energy bills are simply unaffordable. We are in the worst cost of living crisis in living memory. Millions are now turning to food banks. And that was even before Liz Truss and her September of madness. Truss announced a raft of tax cuts with not a hint of where the money was coming from. 45 billion worth of giveaways that would largely benefit the rich. This was an economic experiment using 70 million Britons as guinea pigs. The Resolution Foundation has calculated her 49 days in charge left us with a 30 billion black hole in the UK's finances. Her policies drew widespread criticism from economists, the US presidents, the IMF, but blinkered, she plowed on. It was the politics of the madhouse seeded from right-wing think tanks propagated by millionaire hedge funders whose only interest is feathering the nest of the rich. Her legacy, destroying our economy, decimating growth, humiliating the UK on the world stage and plunging millions more into debt through mortgage hikes and runaway inflation. Conservative Party members that voted for Liz Truss did not do so in ignorance. There were many signs that she was going down an unorthodox and untested fundamentalist right-wing path. Excuse me. Ten years ago, she wrote a book about it. Even Michael Gove warned she was a human hand grenade. 
but still many of you voted for her. When governments mess up, it affects people's lives. And when they mess up this badly, it affects their lives for years to come. Many families in my ward are asking themselves tonight if they can turn the heating on and how they will put a meal on the table, let alone the occasional treat. This was the worst attack on a quality of opportunity in my lifetime, and that is an attack on hope. The Conservative Party and the Conservative councillors here today owe us all an apology for what they've done to Great Britain. All this motion asks them is to say sorry, but they won't which is why I'm sure the people of this country will send their dreadful, uncaring, dangerous and inept Conservative government packing, just as the residents of this borough have done for the last three elections. I formally move the motion. I would now invite Councillor Lang to speak for the administration. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Happy New Year to you all, to all the councillors on both sides, and to council officers, and to all residents of Hammersmith and Fulham. Let's hope it's a good one without any fear. Mayor, I want to fully support Councillor Trahi and Councillor Nwogi in this motion. Trust economics, or Trust onomics, a word I find difficult to say actually, is the Financial Times, one of the Financial Times' words of last year. They call it a radical program of libertarian free market economics based on unfunded tax cuts to be handed with great caution. <laughs> the mini budget last September saw sterling and gilts plummet, knocking. 300 billion pounds, I find it hard to say that number, off the UK stock market, leading, as we know, to a rise in interest rates, mortgage payments for citizens across the country and here in Hammersmith and Fulham, and then tax rises, again affecting citizens across the country and here in Hammersmith and Fulham. Mayor, perhaps you can remember the last full council meeting when our phones were popping with information about the crazy scenes in the House of Commons that night when the government was literally losing control. Well, maybe things have improved slightly, but today we have had the most patronising and partial flat white coffee explanation of inflation <laughs> from our present Chancellor, not mentioning at all the impact of Trussonomics and his tax rises on Hammersmith and Fulham residents. To understand Trussonomics narrative, I believe we need to see it as a phase in the last 13 dire years of Tory rule. David Cameron and George Osborne's austerity programme, explaining the context we now are facing in our NHS, our schools, our justice system, and much more in Hammersmith and Fulham. Theresa May's rudderless uncertainty, leading to further decline in living standards for all of our residents. Boris Johnson, the half-baked economic policy. That's not my words, that's The Spectator, a magazine that he used to edit. And his laughable treaties on cake, pro-having it and pro-eating it. And then we have the Truss and Kwarteng experiment. Financial Times said, the trussonomics experiment appears to have had aggravated an already perilous economic situation, causing lasting damage to our reputation and our place in the world. And now we have Rishi Sunak as Prime Minister. We have a cost of living crisis, austerity mark two, an economy in recession and rising interest rates. Inflation. Yes, it may have dropped today to 10.5%. That's a drop of 0.2% still a 40-year high. It's supposed to be 2%. For those living in Hammersmith and Fulham, food prices continue to soar. Baked beans have gone up 50%. 
milk, 50%, eggs and cheese, 30%. And further interest rates, we're told, are likely in the coming months. Market and international investors still have little faith in investing in the UK. And UK is only is the only Group 7 economy that has not returned to its pre-pandemic size. So Liz Trust has apparently told friends recently that she will continue to fight for slashing taxes and remodelling the British state, despite being the shortest ever serving prime minister. So let us not forget the Conservative members across the country and in Hammersmith and Fulham who voted for her and many who may still support her ideas. Let us not forget the Conservative MPs across the country, many soon to lose their seats, who voted for her and may still support her ideas. And let us not forget Conservative councillors across the country and here in Hammersmith and Fulham who supported and voted for her. Leadership, I believe, is about owning it and taking responsibility. So as the motion seeks, all residents in the Hammersmith and Fulham area are owed an apology from those who supported this reckless and economically damaging experiment. The only path forward is with good local Labour councils like Hammersmith and Fulham showing the way and for there to be a Labour national government to be on the side of all Hammersmith and Fulham residents. Thank you. I have been informed that Councillor Pascal Tulber, Councillor Mary and Councillor Carmel wish to speak. We can begin with Councillor Pascal Tulber. Thank you very much. And I'd like to begin by congratulating Councillor Trey on her maiden speech. Madam Mayor, the 2005 election was fought by Labour under the slogan forward, not back. How nice it would have been to spend more of this evening looking forward, not back, debating the future and what we as councillors can actually influence. So I apologise for the slightly retrospective nature of this debate. In a way, I'm, I'm actually quite impressed by the political courage of Labour tabling a motion asking members to apologise for the behaviour of previous leaders. Tempting though it is for me to go down the obvious routes, Iraq, the financial crisis, anti I could go on. It is actually more valuable, I think, if I use this time to correct some misconceptions. Madam Mayor, the notion that a think tank whose chief executive is Ed Miliband's former policy director doesn't approve of Liz Truss is, I gently suggest, not much of a shock. It ranks somewhere between dog bites man and Pope is a Catholic in terms of scoops. But actually I do the Resolution Foundation a disservice because its report from last November referenced in the motion is more nuanced than the party opposite would have you believe. So to be specific, the 30 billion refers to one sticking with the policy of reversing the 1.25% national insurance rise, which put an extra 1.25% back into people's pockets from last November in order to drive growth and protect people over the long term. And two, the upper bound of up to 10 billion added by higher interest rates and governing, government borrowing costs over the medium term. Now, since that was written in November, government borrowing costs and expectations for interest rates are both back down to where they were before the September fiscal event took place. So not 30 billion, but we'll park that. Now, Madam Mayor, the report looks at the fiscal picture facing the UK at the time and makes clear that, quote unquote, lower growth, not just higher interest rates, is doing a lot of the damage. And remember, this is from a political opponent. It is clear only minority of long term fiscal deterioration has this trust's name on it. Now, it is absolutely right to be worried about long term fiscal deterioration. We've been rocked by COVID, been rocked by Putin, both of which we had no impact. We had had profound economic effects that the whole world is struggling to cope with, but you can't realistically put at the foot of the Conservative Party. And a key driver of whether we do do well fiscally over the long term and fill that fiscal gap will be due to growth, which unsurprisingly, given the big global stories, is currently pretty unstable in outlook. Here's the Resolution Foundation once again, the uncomfortable reality is that unless global energy price rises reverse, we will remain poorer as a country than we'd hope to be. 
So here's a surprise from the report. Growth is crucial. Liz Truss actually got that bit right, the need to focus on growing the economy. And this is where the difference between our parties lies, because the whole economic point of the Conservatives has been to seek every opportunity to grow the economy. Sometimes that's by protecting people, as we did during the pandemic. Sometimes it's through supply side reforms. It is consistently by being open to investment, seeking global opportunities, trying to put money into people's pockets where they can spend and invest it better than the state, and creating the conditions for record job creation. Now, I cannot pretend over the past three years, everything has been got right as we tackled once in a lifetime global problems. But by contrast, from the party opposite, all we've had is lock down further, spend more, saying don't do it that way without saying how they would actually do it. And of course, waffle. Cast your mind back if you can bear it to Keir Starmer's speech on the economy last summer. One key plank of his flagship economic program was be distinctly British. What does that even mean? Are we going to build more Austin Allegro's with bulldogs on them? Madam Mayor, the Conservatives have been unafraid to show leadership in growing the economy and leading it through incredibly turbulent times. And sometimes an element of leadership is, as Councillor Lang said, owning it, acknowledging when you don't get it right and swiftly changing. That is leadership. That is what we do because we look forward, not back. And that is what the Conservative government is all about. Thank you very much. Councillor Mary. Thank you very much. I can't believe we've just heard an attempt to defend the Liz Trust government. <laughs> and uh, and I, I, only, I only wish that the people that were affected by her government could look forward and not back. So I'd like to start by reminding ourselves, as my colleagues have done, that what we're talking about here is not an abstract academic political economic discussion. We're talking about real human impact, people's livelihoods, people's lives. So imagine having saved up for a deposit, all the hours worked, all the sacrifices made, maybe some of us in this room know what that feels like, only to have your aspirations decimated in the space of a week or a few weeks, or being a single parent, struggling already, you know, because of the economic situation. Now you're struggling even more to complete a full food shop. Or a small business owner like my, my father, the sleepless nights and the uncertainty as our economy slides back into recession. That's the real human cost of 49 days of chaotic government. And you know, the figures are clear as well. The annual rate of inflation for food is now at its highest level since 1977. Inflation remains particularly high for low-income families, and that the, um, the poorest families experience an inflation rate 2% higher than everyone else in December. Think about that, December, the month that's so important for families and, and children. They might say, I predict they might say this motion isn't local, as they're fond of saying. Tell that to the people of Hammersworth and Fulham, who are going to pay more on their mortgages, food and energy. So I suggest that in any of the responses that we hear, they keep that front of mind. And when it comes to our, uh, our spending decisions as a council, they have no grounds to criticize us. The two causes for the financial situation that we're in, meaning we have to make some difficult decisions, are number one, chronic underfunding by successive conservative prime ministers, and number two, the Liz Trust fiasco. Uh, my, my colleague, Councillor Lang, mentioned the Jeremy Hunt video. I don't know if Everyone's seen that was posted on Twitter today. He's talking about the reasons for inflation and how he might solve it. Didn't once mention the mini budget. It's shocking levels of denial. And we're not being partisan. We know the impact Ukraine has had. We know the impact COVID has had. Nobody would deny that. But why are we doing way worse than other countries? When times are tough globally, you need a particularly responsible and particularly steady government. Again, why are we doing way worse than comparable nations? Two words, Liz Truss. Again, like one of my colleagues mentioned, it's not like we couldn't see this coming. Those of us who paid attention to what Liz Truss was saying, anyone that bothered to listen to what she was saying and, and her plans would have known that it was going to end in disaster. Even some in the Conservative Party uh, could, could see that. 
Apparently, some of Hammersmith and Fulham's Tory councillors couldn't. Some of them were wise enough, wiser than their colleagues anyway, to not support her, but some of them I hear even voted for her. So if you want to make it local, let's make it local. The closest thing we have to Liz Trust in Hammersmith and Fulham are the Conservative councillors that voted for her. So in her absence, will you apologise for the mess that was caused? Thank you. Councillor Carmel. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, I'm also suffering uh, IT problems and my laptop has uh, decided to lock itself. And it's my, my best efforts. Um, it's not uh, uh, being kind to me. But uh, I too uh, had a look at the source material for this, uh, this motion, uh, which was a spotlight publication written by that well-known right winger, Torsten Bell. Um, it was called One Statement, Two Challenges, how the autumn statement is likely to respond to weaker public finances and higher energy bills. Now, my colleague has uh, uh, quoted from this already, but um, a few more things I want to say uh, about uh, the actual publication as opposed to what is uh, in the febrile uh, imagination uh, of the proposer and seconder of this motion. The autumn statement, it can be looked at as a tale of two economic policy challenges, shaped but far from created by Liz Truss's brief tenure in Downing Street. The challenges that the Chancellor is answering on Thursday are highly related, but for different reasons stand out for their inherent tensions that cannot be fully resolved goes on to say, Liz Truss did not create a fiscal hole. It does, I, I grant you, say, but she just dug it deeper. Now, if I look at the wording of this motion, it says, the council notes the Resolution Foundation has calculated that the Trust Conservative government was responsible for causing at least 30 billion pounds of the fiscal hole now in the UK finances. Now, as my colleague has ably demonstrated that figure is completely out of date and untrue now. But what also is untrue is what the report said. It says, she, by increasing borrowing by up to 30 billion, not at least 30 billion, up to. And I fear that inadvertently, I hope, they are trying to mislead you, Mayor, into thinking that the situation was worse than the Resolution Foundation report um, actually says. The second part of the motion, the puerile nature of asking for an apology from all Conservative Party members who voted in a secret ballot is even below the standard that I would expect at an NUS conference. It is ludicrous. And you know, just totally, as you well know, uh, not going to happen. I mean, for instance, we never called for uh, all Labour Party members to apologise for when Gordon Brown sold off our gold reserves, having announced it to the markets first. So everything went uh, southwards and creating a huge fiscal back hole at that time. But I am reminded looking at this motion, of the great novel by Miguel de Cervantes, Don Quixote. And as I'm sure you're aware, Mayor, in the 17th century, the term Quixote was used to describe a person who does not distinguish between reality and imagination. The poet John Cleveland, as I'm sure you're aware, wrote in 1644 in his book, The Character of a London Diurnal, the Quixotes of this age fight with the windmills of their own heads. And I'm sometimes thinking that this current Labour administration is very little different from the Quixotes of the 17th century. Thank you very much. Are there any other speakers on this motion? Yes, Councillor Dinsmore. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, we've already wasted 25 minutes uh, talking about this. I think in my last speech, I did mention that this isn't a debating society. If you want to get in your soapbox and go to Hyde Park and complain about Liz Trust, you can do it. If you want to go to Parliament and protest, you can. And if you want to write a blog about it, you can. We have such limited, precious time in this chamber to discuss actual policy. Not a single Labour speech has produced any policy out of this that we can discuss and go to residents mm -hmm. and say to them tomorrow, what did you achieve last night in council? Oh, well, we complained about 44 days of Liz Truss. OK, great. Well, what have you done for me to change that? Oh, well, nothing. We didn't actually discuss policy. It's a complete waste of time. We can all play the same game. We can talk about the Iraq war and the human cost and the hundreds and thousands of dead servicemen and Iraqis that have been killed. But that's not what we're here to do. We are here to discuss policies. We have put forward two special motions on key policies affecting real people that we actually want to debate to see if we can shape policy to change things for our residents. And so I implore the council, please stop this political showmanship. And let's get down to actually debating real policies that affect real people. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other speakers on this motion? I would. Sorry, so, may, I, may I just clarify something, Madam Mayor? Yes, when you say you want to things, talk about things that affect real people, are you suggesting that what we've just discussed didn't affect real people? Yes, that's a direct I question, have... I assume I'm allowed to answer. Yes, yes I'd like to discuss the solutions for those real people. Everything in the globe affects people. The Ukraine war is obviously affecting people here now. COVID is affecting people here now. Let's discuss possible solutions that this council can present. There are some motions today that we will discuss where we will get into policy. But we've now spent nearly half an hour complaining about Liz Trust and asking people in this party on this side one how they voted and that they should apologize i have no idea how councillor mary knows who voted for what and i know this special motion says that um those that voted for her should apologize and yet councillor daly is asking for everybody to apologize even if you didn't vote for her. but i mean what's the point of these statements what was the point in going down this route let's discuss the solutions so i don't doubt that some of these things can have an impact but let's discuss the solution to them not keep moaning about the problem yeah. Yeah. Councillor Trey, do you wish to sum up? Um, well, I would I disagree. Um, I, I'm going to I'm going to quote Churchill. Those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And if the conservative side of this chamber does not acknowledge the damage that that economic policy did to this country, then we can't move forward. The um, the think tanks, as I called them, the, uh, the the think tanks coming out of the right wing, are still forging these um, economic policies forward. They're not consigned to the history books. And if we keep making the same mistakes, then the country will not go, can continue to grow. Andrew Bailey, the Bank of England governor, said just yesterday, we are still suffering the hangover effects of Liz Truss's um, 49 days. So, um, yeah, the report says she dug it deeper. I'm quoting your, your speeches now. So you acknowledge that the damage done by the pre previous Conservative governments was equally destructive and Liz Trust just dug it deeper, but an awful lot deeper. I sum up, I move, I formally move the motion. <laughs> Is the motion agreed? Agreed. I would now put the motion to a vote. Those in favour? Those against? Those not voting? I declare the motion carried. We can now move to special motion from five, the Conservative government's failing justice system. I call on Councillor Harvey and Councillor Homan to move and second. 
That would be good. Special motion four, the crisis in the NHS and the importance of having saved Charing Cross Hospital. I call on Councillor Coleman and Councillor Quigley to move and second. Formally moved. Formally seconded. Councillor Coleman. Thank you very much, Mayor. I, I suppose this is going to disappoint Councillor Dismore. I can understand him not wanting to discuss these sorts of things because his colleagues then have to stand up and show their true colours and defend Liz Truss and defend the shameful behaviour of this government and go on record as doing so. And that doesn't serve them well in the long term. So I can understand he doesn't want to discuss these sort of matters. Um, I was going to say, I think there can't be a single person in this room who can deny that our NHS and indeed the country are in crisis. Um, but having heard some of the responses I've just heard from the people opposite, I think there may be some people in the room who deny that they're in crisis. Of course, we all we all disagree on the uh, sure on the, re the reasons. The prime minister's blamed the terrible Russian invasion of Ukraine. Councillor Pascal Tabori blamed COVID. Um, others have reflected on the disaster of Brexit. They certainly have a role to play, um, Mayor, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to look a bit backwards before going forwards and look at the underlying causes of the crisis that, that facing this, this, this um, country and facing the NHS. Because as the motion says, and as colleagues of mine have eloquently pointed out, the real result, the, the real problem here is the result of political choices made in the name of the Conservative government's ideologically driven austerity programme. And that's a programme which began when Labour lost power in 2010. It was spearheaded by David Cameron and George Osborne, easily the worst chance of my lifetime, until quasi quite of course. Um, and George Osborne, who I'm sorry to say had the full support of Greg Hansen during his time as Chief Secretary to the Treasury. Because let's remember, if I'm allowed to look back, that before Osborne and Hans, by the time of the 2010 election, the Labour government had reduced waiting lists in the NHS to just 2.5 million people. Under the Conservative government, they've risen to 4.4 million people. When Labour was in power, spending and investment on healthcare and overall went up. When the Conservatives came in, it went down. It went down with faster, deeper cuts than any other developed country after the global financial crisis. So conservative austerity, it sucked the life out of the state, it sucked the life out of the services that our people need to stay strong and to stay healthy. And while the NHS was apparently protected, this was a sham because people in this country are living longer, rapidly aging, they're in less good health, and you, the demands therefore in the NHS are greater, and you have to increase the funding to keep up with that, and they didn't. So while in comparable countries, and again, um, these are, this, is a lot, this is based on a lot of Financial Times data, where they've done a lot of number crunching recently, and they've compared dozens of countries, uh, perhaps we can uh, talk about that, they've looked at those countries, and health spending in those comparable countries grew as a share of GDP from 2010, but not in the UK. In the UK, it didn't, to the extent that we now have lower overall health spend than comparable countries, and we wonder why we're in crisis. So there's a lack, there was a lack of investment in training and in recruitment and in buildings. So we have fewer doctors, we have fewer nurses, fewer beds, fewer intensive care places ahead of population compared with these other countries. We have a third of hospital beds by population of Germany. So by the time COVID hit, our hospitals were in a weaker state to deal with all the people that fell ill. And with all the knock-on impact on planned operations that we're only too aware of, which we're still seeing the results of today. That said, I haven't we have to say, but thank goodness in this borough, we had Charing Cross Hospital. You know, can you imagine how we would have coped during COVID if the Conservative government had succeeded in its plans to close down the hospital? if the campaigns that we fought, which the Conservatives opposed, because they said there was no threat to Charing Cross Hospital, if the campaign we fought alongside residents to save the hospital hadn't been successful, where would we be now in the face of Conservative opposition? And I think we should take a moment, as, as always is appropriate when we talk about the hospital, to pay tribute to the wonderful doctors and the nurses and the support staff there who are still doing tremendous work for us. But Mayor, good healthcare isn't just about making people better when they're sick, it's about preventing illness. So, it's, so when you have a government which cuts benefits, introduces the bedroom tax, cuts rent subsidies, cuts council funds, reduces social care, cuts funding for social housing, and makes people poorer and less healthy, you also have to look. You have to look at the impact on not just on the healthcare system, but on the whole range of things, the social determinants 
all of which the government has attacked in its time in office. And you arrive at the state we are today with real wages below where they were 18 years ago and life expectancy lower than in most developed countries. So, Mayor, the crisis facing our country's healthcare is not Ukraine or the other things that have been mentioned. It is simply the result of 12 years of the Conservatives. So I say, and it's not a radical idea, I think, that the time is long overdue for the Conservative Party to pay the price and for the country to have a chance to elect a Labour government to improve services and build a stronger, safer, kinder and healthier country. Thank you. Councillor Quigley. Good evening, Mayor. Professor Sir, uh, Sir Michael Marmot chaired the Independent Review to propose the most effective evidence-based strategy for reducing health inequalities in England. The report, Fair Society, Healthy Life, is known as the, the Marmot Review, was published in 2010. As the motion notes, this stated that there are the older people's social and economic statuses, the poor their health is. It stresses that how health is affected by a whole range of what are called social determinants, such as housing, income, education, social isolation, and disability. So shortly after its publication, the Conservatives came into power. They then produced the white, white paper setting out their strategy for public health in England. This explicitly adopted the review and to quote, the life of course, the life course of framework for tackling the wider social determinants of health. As Marmot had urged, they devolved the public health system to local authorities and created a new national body, Public Health England. It sounds good, doesn't it? Truth be told, it wasn't and it isn't. As Mar Marmot says, and as the Conservative government claims to accept, keeping people well means addressing all the other things which affect people's health, income, housing, disability, education, and so on. Sadly, government funding across the, pe the piece was cut year on year in the name of austerity. In Hammersmith and Fulham, this meant a cut of 56% in real terms from 164 million to 116 million. Even a pound funding increases for the NHS didn't keep pace with the growth in demand, so they were effectively cut. The government also directly cut welfare benefits, introduced the bedroom tax, cut rent sub subsidy, neglected social care, and reduced funding for social housing, and generally sucked the lifeblood out of the country all in the name of austerity. In Hammersmith and Fulham, we have fought so hard to protect these services. Our ruthlessly financially efficient approach means that we continue to be the only bar to offer care at home for free, as well as provide free primary school references, keeping our parks and libraries open, and I've done so many other things to support residents. Mayor, I'd like to turn to the specific impact on disabled people who have been particularly badly affected by these cuts. Over the past decades, the Tories have pushed more disabled people into poverty every day, and it's only got worse with the cost of living crisis. Mayor, you may remember a full council motion last year in which we looked at the cruel cuts of to a range of disability benefits. Now, the lack of funding for health services means that disabled yeah. people are having to choose mm -hmm. which medical equipment to use. Imagine for a moment, if you can, being in a situation where you have to actually do that. For example, ventilator or oxygen machine, electric scooter or electric wheelchair, heat or eat. It all takes money. Disabled people are one group of people most affected by the cost of living crisis. Some items you get a rebate for, others you don't. It's very hit and miss, and it gets worse. The government and the energy regulator, Ofgem, have advised people who use medical equipment they must make their own contingency plans. 
and they won't receive more than basic support from the government or industry in the event of the planned power cuts this winter. So what am I and others expected to do? Invest in a portable, portable generator? You've got to be joking. In, it's 2020, 2023, and yet it feels like we are heading back to the 1970s. And yet, I, do, I am that old. And planned power cuts, which happened while the Tories were in power back then. Edward Heath was Prime Minister. It does feel like we are tumbling from one bad situation to another, and there seems to be no end in sight unless we have a general election and Labour gets into power. Mayor, if the Conservative government have been really committed to improving people's lives and reducing the health inequalities in England, they would have made the funding available across a whole range of areas for this. Instead, they cut this in the name of austerity. They Thanks failed to do... Could you begin to sum up, please? Thank yes, you. I will. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, they failed to do what they promised, and people of this country are poor and sicker as a result. I urge m- members to support this, mo- m- this motion, and I hope I haven't wasted people's time. Thank you. I have been informed that Councillor Vaughan, Councillor Borland, Councillor Perez, Councillor Afonso and Councillor Ceaseless also wish to speak. We can begin with Councillor Vaughan. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to start tonight by following uh, Councillor Coleman and thanking everyone working in our local NHS and social care system. The pressures on you, as we've detailed already, are immense, but you still carry on serving the people of this borough providing the health care, providing the home care, the support that the people of this borough need. As always, you have our support and admiration, and thank you for all that you do. But these current pressures only serve to illustrate why this Labour Council worked so hard with residents to save Charing Cross Hospital. The motion, as, as you know, before you tonight, notes many of these points, but just recap that the government, and it's worth putting this on record, was planning to demolish the hospital and sell off most of the site, make Charing Cross into a local hospital, essentially a clinic, 13% of the size of the current hospital with few services on site, and cut hundreds of acute beds out of our local NHS as a result. As you'll recall, this was backed by the Conservative administration at the time, to their eternal shame. It took seven years of campaigning by this council and residents before the plans were finally scrapped. Similar to Councillor Coleman, given the current crisis in the NHS, I shudder to think what would happen locally during COVID and during this NHS crisis if those crucial beds had been taken away. Recent statistics show these struggles, as across London, some NHS trusts aren't even able to see 50% of the most urgent cases going to A&E within four hours. It's a grim situation for our NHS. And waiting lists, which had been brought down to record lows under Labour, have been shooting up to record highs under this Conservative government. Awful statistics that were neatly captured in a recent chart on this subject by the FT's data expert. Shuddering to think. This really is a terrible legacy. Terrible legacy. It's our precious NHS And we, on this side, believe our residents deserve so much better than this. But on the flip side, I'm delighted um, in this motion that this council really is serving residents with its outstanding reablement service and by providing free home care. It's difficult to overstate the importance of the reablement service. As you know, it's helping the NHS by reducing delayed discharges, meaning we hope that our residents who are in hospital can go home in a timely manner as support will be at hand to get them back on their feet when they return home. It's also helping residents who need the support to regain their independence quickly once they arrive home from hospital. That's because, all being well, they will only need support for six to eight weeks. That really is vital in ensuring their health and happiness 
something I hope we all support. There are, just by way of aside, um, some great stories of residents who benefited from the reablement service on the LBHF website. I'd, all, I'd take you, urge you all to take a look as they bring the importance of this service to life. Thank you, of course, to all the staff providing this important service. And providing free adult social care adds to this mix of health and social care. It ensures residents who need it are getting the care that they actually need to allow them to live their day-to-day -day lives. And again, it's ensuring that they maintain their independence and they aren't reliant um, on, on uh, others. But a final reflection, Mayor. Our NHS and social care systems, as I've discussed, work together. This council and residents fought hard to keep a vital part of it, Charing Cross Hospital, open, and how right we were. But we also need the reablement, the home care, to give our residents the support they need to live independent and hopefully healthy lives. This council is committed to them, and we thank all who work in that service because, as someone said recently, when we clap for carers, we really meant it. Thank you. Councillor Borland. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I would like to start by recognising the fantastic work that our dedicated NHS staff do. In Hammersmith and Fulham, we're incredibly lucky to have brilliant hospitals. And in 2012, the clinician-led NHS Northwest London started a plan for shaping a healthier future. And this plan was recommended for government approval. But fast forward to 2019, and it was decided that shaping a healthier future wasn't the correct way forward for NHS Northwest London and was put aside. And I would like to commend local activists for bringing to light potential issues around the plan and thank our MP, Greg Hans, for successfully lobbying the then Health Minister for intervention and understanding that a different approach was required. I had the cause to use the NHS Urgent Care Service just last summer. I had the rather embarrassingly millennial accident of falling downstairs while scrolling through Instagram. I hobbled around at home for a day or two, but after my toes started to turn blue, I decided it was probably worthwhile getting an X-ray. I spent three and a half hours in Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, and during that time, I saw a triage nurse, an X-ray technician, an urgent care doctor, and had a consultation with a radiologist. Wow, I thought. How lucky am I to have been treated by four extremely skilled medical practitioners in under four hours, all free at the point of service. Things that some other countries could only dream of. But I also thought, wow, all that can't be cheap. And it's not. At the beginning of the year, polling company Redfield and Wilton Strategies asked the question, how much more in tax would you be willing to pay every year to provide funding to the NHS? Now, just 7% of respondents ticked the 500 to 1,000 pounds a year box. And the most chosen category was nothing more than I do now at 43% of respondents. That same company found that 64% feel that healthcare is the most important issue when considering who they vote for. So if we don't want to pay more, we need to do better with what we've already got. Now, personally, I've never met a conservative who doesn't support the aims of the NHS and doesn't want it to be a world-class service. But we do tend to agree that the answer to its problems cannot simply be more and more money. Now, there are many examples of NHS inefficiencies, but I'm conscious of time, so I'll mention two in particular that stood out to me today. We have a drive across the country and across the world to push for inclusive inclusivity throughout life. And that's extremely important, especially in our public services. The NHS now employs around 800 diversity, equity and inclusion officers and managers, which cost the NHS around 40 million pounds a year. When we're hearing testimonials from frontline staff about how overrun they are, I personally think we need to prioritize medical need and would suggest that 800 is not a current priority. Also, despite current sorry, despite earlier reform to stop the prescribing of unnecessary over-the-counter medicines for minor illnesses, in the year 2021 to 22, the NHS spent 73.7 million pounds prescribing paracetamol, 
£25 million on aspirin, and over £12 million on ibuprofen. Now, all of these can be bought for well under a pound in most supermarkets, but cost the NHS about £4.50 a pack. Prior to reform in 2019, the NHS spent around £569 million on over-the-counter prescriptions for items such as dandruff shampoo and sun cream. Now, these costs are simply not sustainable, but it shows how reform can save money. Now, let's be clear, reform should not be a dirty word. Just this week, the leader of the Labour Party spoke of the need for change, but the mere suggestion had the MP for Hackney North and Stoke Newington tweeting, Keir Starmer has joined the right in calling for reform of the NHS, and we all know what that means. Now, whilst I cannot agree with his suggestion of self-referral for internal bleeding, I do think that we have to have genuine conversations about the NHS if we want to see it flourish and make it fit for a future with growing needs. We now we need to be able to have these conversations without suggesting that people won't have access to free healthcare and without it being seen as an attack on our doctors and nurses and without unfairly painting conservatives as grim reapers with blue rosettes. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Perez, do you wish to speak? Yes. Thank you, Mayor, for calling on me to speak in support of this special motion. We all know or have been reminded of the essential role that Charing Cross Hospital played during the COVID-19 pandemic and the steps the Labour Administration has taken to protect our hospitals and local health services. We all know how this administration working with local residents and local groups, including Hamilton and Fulham Silver NHS, fought successfully to save the hospital. Sadly, Mayor, they were opposed by many local conservative politicians, including the MP for Chelsea and Fulham. These people denied the hospital was threatened and attacked Labour's campaign to save it. The MP for Chelsea and Fulham even tried to take credit afterwards for saving the hospital. That was very cheeky. Thanks to the campaign led by the Labour Administration, however, Charing Cross Hospital continues to care for the residents of Hammersmith and Fulham and beyond. Thank you to the doctors, nurses, support staff delivering these vital services. I am proud to be part of an administration that delivers on its pledges and puts residents' interest at the heart of everything it does an administration that recognizes the importance of investing and supporting in social care. An administration that is the only one in the country to have abolished charges for care at home for elderly and disabled people, unlike Hamilton and Fulham conservative councillors who have voted in the past unanimously against supporting free home care in our borough. Major, one of the most important things our social care team does is to enable people to get back on their feet once they come out of hospital. The jargon word for that is reablement. Councillor Vaughan has spoken about the reablement team and I want to celebrate what they have achieved as well. Last month, we received the impressive news that our reablement team was rated outstanding by the Care Quality Commission for the third time in a row. The team is made up of some 30 professionals from the council and NHS including social workers, doctors, nurses, and physios. These work together to enable people coming out of hospital to regain their independence. For six to eight weeks, they, retain, they retrain people to wash and dress themselves, to do things by themselves again without support. As a result, people regain their confidence and their ability to continue to live independently at home. They retain mm -hmm. their dignity. Even if they still require some ongoing care, they are able to lead their lives at their full potential. Without this kind of help, people may never regain their independence. They may get, they may get ill again and go back into hospital. So free reablement is also an essential part of reducing the huge pressures which Charing Cross and our other local hospitals are under at this time. It frees up beds and means that other people who need hospital treatment can be admitted more quickly. And by helping people get back on their feet, it also reduces the need for extensive longer term care, which also reduces costs. Major, the service also receives numerous compliments from residents. I would like to read a few as an example from Social Care Director Lisa Redfern's recent newsletter to staff. 
The team were thorough, informative, helpful, empathetic, kind. Vinnie, our main care, was tremendously helpful, caring and knowledgeable, a great asset to your team. We will miss him. To all the staff that was involved in my care, thank you so much. The service was impe impeccable, very satisfied. An excellent service, which has helped me on my way to achieving independence. Major, given this, it will come as no surprise to you to learn that the service is in the top 4% in the country. I hope that all members here tonight will wish to join me in congratulating the Rehabilitation Team Manager Phyllis McKenzie and all her colleagues for their outstanding work in such challenging times. Please support this motion. Thank you very much. Councillor Afonso. Madam Mayor, I want to start by paying tribute to all those who work in the NHS. Like many in our borough and across the country, the NHS has been there for my family when we needed it most. Two years ago, my father was diagnosed with cancer. My father has since made a full recovery, but the care and attentiveness of our fantastic NHS throughout his treatment will live with me forever. Madam Mayor, the 2019 Conservative Manifesto promised two big things on health. 50,000 more nurses and health institutes by the next election and 50, 000, 50 million more GP appointments. In November 2019, there were 296,000 nurses and health visitors working in the NHS. Latest figures show there are 321,000 nurses and health visitors in England as of March 2022. This means there are 25,000 more nurses and health visitors showing the government is on track to deliver on its promise. On GP appointments, in the year to May 2019, there are an estimated 291 million GP appointments. In the year to May 2022, there were just over 322 million, so an increase of 31 million appointments per year thus far. Madam Mayor, in early 2020, our NHS faced its greatest challenge to date, the COVID-19 pandemic. Our NHS rose to the occasion, and many people owe their lives to the life-saving treatments provided in our fantastic hospitals and the speedy rollout of our British-made AstraZeneca vaccine. The government's vaccine delivery was the first of its kind in Europe. Bold steps were taken to back the Oxford AstraZeneca team, which saved hundreds of thousands of lives. But don't take it from me. The Public Accounts Committee said in its report that it commended the government for its world-beating progress as it launched the largest vaccination program in the UK's history in response to the pandemic. With a population density higher than anywhere else in Western Europe, our government backed the science and the science delivered. Had we followed the leader of the opposition's advice to join in with the EU's programme, who knows how many lives would have been lost? However, we all know that COVID has caused lasting damage to waiting lists. How has our government responded? By launching the biggest catch-up programme in the NHS's history, with an extra two billion this year to start to tackle the backlog. In addition, the government plans to spend eight billion in the three years to 2024-25. This could deliver the equivalent of around nine million more checks scans and procedures. It will also mean the NHS in England could aim to deliver around 30% more elective activity by 2024-25 than it did before the pandemic. Madam Mayor, locally we are seeing the benefits of the government's 3.7 billion health infrastructure plan. The government committed to a major floor-by-floor -floor refurbishment of Charing Cross, which is already in progress. Furthermore, funds have been committed to rebuild Hammersmith Hospital, provide new clinical academic redevelopment. Near Imperial College in the White City campus, which will be co-located with the Imperial College Biomedical Campus at White City, delivering on local people's priorities. But what ideas do we get from the Labour Party on health, one might ask. Having not been able to find the mythical but heavily promoted fully costing health costed health plan that Wes Streeting seems to have lost behind his sofa, I have had to try and decipher the Shadow Health Secretary's plans based on his public statements. One particular policy that drew my attention was that under Labour, we would be able to refer ourselves to hospital for specialist care, bypassing GPs. So while I congratulate Wes Streeting for repackaging A&E for non-emergencies, 
the chair of the BMA had a different approach to this subject. And I quote, where Streeting does not understand general practice. Madam Mayor, a shadow health secretary that has no plan and no idea. We on this side take solace that our government has a long-term plan for the NHS. Our government got our country through COVID and our government will build an NHS suitable for the 21st century. Yeah. Yeah. Councillor Cecilius, do you wish to speak? Oh, you bet. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I remember back in 2012, uh, it was a warm Greek summer night. Um, and with my friends, that's how we were having fun. We we're watching the London Olympics opening ceremony. And to be honest, we we're quite bemused and amused with what we're seeing. Why, for what reason are we seeing ambulances and children in hospital beds and doctors parading? And what, what is this? Is this what you want to showcase to the world? Is this what is important to you? We didn't get it. I definitely didn't get it. And I'm ashamed to say I didn't even get it in 2014. By that point, having moved to uh, Hammersmith, living next to Charing Cross Hospital, and I was getting all those leaflets. The conservatives will tear it down. No, will not. No, we'll improve it. No, we'll do this. I'm ashamed to say I wasn't paying attention. And naively, I thought, surely there cannot be a party. There cannot be people here who will say, yes, this massive hospital you see next to you, where you see people coming in and out every day. Yeah, we're going to knock it down completely. Naively. But that was actually what was happening. That was the despicable plan that was uh, in place. That's what they wanted to do. And unfortunately for them, fortunately for the rest of us, that didn't come to pass. And I'll explain later why, when I look forward, not backwards. <laughs> so then we moved to 2018. And that's the point where I started to get it. At that point, I was a candidate in Munster, of all places. Beast from the East, very cold. And we're canvassing and we're knocking on those we had no right to be knocking on. And we're talking to people who were definitely conservative voters and still are, probably will be for all their lives. And they were talking to us for the simple reason that we're going to them to talk about Charing Cross Hospital. And you could see the love that was there, not just because they were using it or their family was using it, but because they could see that it was an asset to the community, it was something that people would feel, feel love about and they would understand the importance it had for the wider community. And then, of course, we had 2020, and I remember how it was both frightening, but also weirdly comforting to see on BBC Newsnight the dispatches from the a and &E in Charing Cross and the health workers completely exhausted, and perhaps demoralized, frightened themselves, uh, going around and trying to save people in A&E &E and in the operating rooms who were struggling with, with COVID. I'm very proud to be serving for the ward that has Charing Cross Hospital in it. I'm very proud to be serving that community around which over many years with posters on the doors, with grassroots campaigning, or even through the vote, they managed to save Charing Cross Hospital. But it's not, of course, just about the hospital or any hospital. It's about what those hospitals represent and about what the NHS represents. Because what this country is, what this shows us, what the message of 2012 was, whether the country we want to be, the society we want to be in, the society we actually are, is a compassionate society, the society that looks after its weakest members, its weakest links, the most vulnerable, a society that places community at its heart. So when we spend the last 13 years, and if you start from 2006, local elections, even more, uh, with the Conservatives attacking, undermining, uh, underfunding the NHS, and completely uh, demoralizing its own workforce, what they've been doing, it's not just attacking the healthcare uh, of our nation, but attacking the very essence of our nation. It's very so the national psyche and what we believe to be. It didn't have to be this way. And of course, it doesn't have to be this way. Councillor Boland, we are not incredibly lucky to have great hospitals in area. It wasn't pure luck. HNF Labour campaigned for this and joined forces with grassroots campaigners and had the support of local voters. And that's how we saved our great hospitals and that's how we saved our NHS. And this will continue, not just locally, we will continue with this nationally because national labor, with the help of grassroots campaigns from across the country and voters from across the country, will also save the NHS nationally. And that's moving forward and not just backwards. In 2020, the slogan that we had for the COVID pandemic was, stay safe, stay home rather, uh, protect the NHS, save lives. 
Now, we're coming to the tail end of 13 year long Tory pandemic that has decimated our NHS, demoralized the nation and completely undermined everything we believe in. Our slogan will be vote Labour, kick the Tories out, save the NHS, save this country. And that is the solution to today's problems, Councillor Dismo. Thank you very much. Are there any other speakers on this motion? In that case, I call on Councillor Coleman to sum up. Thank you, Mayor. Whew. Disappointing, wasn't it? Um, I mean, at least in the old days, the leader of the Conservative group attempted to pretend leader by simply claiming what's possible, although the readings and readings between shows that. I think you've got great doing that. Uh, I mean, it's, it, 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 it's, I'm sorry to come back to what you said, but it's absolutely absurd to try and say that the restatement of the economy is they just can't say uh, it's possible. He said it was not present. These are all, and I think it's really interesting. And I mean, check it. We brought him up again and again and again in the past season to provide the check river. He said the hospital was not present. He attacked the campaign and said it was scaremongering. When the campaign finally won because there was nowhere else they had to go, he said he had saved the hospital, which was never present. He is an absolute master of the first merit campaign. He, there's nothing that he will say that is completely positive, like I said previously, if he was expedient at the time. Unfortunately, we are here to keep him, uh, keep his toes to the fire, should we say, and to expose the nonsense. Talking of nonsense, if I may, I was truly shocked by the clever idea for saving some money in the NHS. The NHS has a budget of £158 billion. Pounds. So the bright idea that came up today. Um, that's the forum was to sack the people, 800 people apparently, working on equality and diversity in hospitals. Anybody who knows about the topic of our staff say regularly we work at the NHS, I mean, you can see the Lewis, all hospitals, private state, and I did say that they were the most more discrimination occurring with the people of color this year and last year and the year before, both from patients and the family to management. We in Northwest London, I and Amsterdam, who put the trade office in this case, have a commitment to sanding structural racism in the national hospitals. You do not tackle structural racism by sanding the people who are there to help you tackle structural racism. If you care about these things, you fund and it's not even the pimple or the hair or the gnats to talk about the problem. These are ridiculous comments, and the sort of one that only someone who, in the great respect, there's another comment which is simply inaccurate, and you need to check your facts before you present these facts, otherwise, you're falling into the very category of doing things. You said that the refurbishment of the Charrington Hospital was underway. You clearly have not seen a statement made by Brooke Prince, the Minister of State and Department of Health, just a couple of days ago. He said he set up a table to show the scheme plan and the status of land secured for the new hospital. The program, there are 20, 30 places there for planning permission, awaiting outline planning permission, sharing cross hospital, imperial hospitals, no planning permission in place. Nothing is happening. It is not happening. Whoever has told you, maybe Mr. Hancock in his old days, maybe Mr. Hans now, that there is refurbishment taking place of Charing Cross Hospital. It is not, I hope it will be the case, but it is not yet happening. What is happening is our hospital is having to cope with years and years of underinvestment in the National Health Service. We're having to cope with the legacy of a government austerity program driven by George Osborne, supported by Greg Hans as the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, which made people poorer and iller, not just by depriving them of health care, as I said, but by not addressing other things which make people ill, by cutting benefits, and Councillor Quigley referred to the attack on disability benefits, by introducing the bedroom tax, by cutting rent subsidies, by forcing families to move to other boroughs far away from family, friends and support networks if they're going to find somewhere they can afford to live, cutting council's funding 58% over the last decade or so, neglecting social care. I love the statement that Jeremy Hunt made. We're going to take difficult decisions, he said in his budget. You know what his difficult decision on social care was? That he would ask councils to take the difficult decision of whether or not they were going to ask residents to increase the council tax by 2% to pay for social care. That's not taking a difficult decision. It's shoving it down on local councils and then blaming them later. 
well, we're going to do whatever we need to do to protect social care in this borough and keep it free. The only people in the country still to do that, but I hope something that the Labour government will want to take forward for the whole country. And the sooner we get an end to this nonsense, this obfuscation, this fabrication, this lack of factual accuracy, as soon as we get an end to 10, 12, 13 years of austerity, of people telling us we have to make more cuts, cuts in diversity, cuts in equality, anti-racism cuts, the better. So yes, let's bring on West Streeting, let's bring on Keir Starmer, let's bring on a Labour government, and let's do something good for this country, finally. Is the motion agreed? I will now put the motion to a vote. Those in favour? <coughs> Those against? Those not voting? The motion is carried. We can now move to special motion five, the Conservative government's failing justice system. I call on Councillor Harvey and Councillor Homan to move and second. Move the motion. Formally second. Councillor Harvey. Madam Mayor, we're deeply concerned that crime is rising and that the Conservative government are failing the crim criminal justice system. Police recorded violence is up 13% from nearly 1.8 million cases to over 2 million in 2021. Sexual offences have increased by 32% and of those 37% of um, offences are recorded as rape. According to the Victims Commissioner, prosecutions have fallen by nearly 60%. Victims of crime are suffering. There is now a backlog of over 335,000 cases waiting for a court hearing. Since 2010, under the Conservatives, half of magistrates courts have been sold off and there are further 77 due to be closed by 2026. Also, magistrates have, par um, have halved in the past decade. So we have half the amount of magistrates we did 10 years ago. Barristers have been on strike and people are worried about the low numbers of police on our streets and also some of the professionalism of them. This week, Suella Breverman, in response to the recent Carrot case, said that it's a sobering moment for the reputation of British policing. But I just wonder how many sobering moments do we need under this Conservative government? Because for a huge number of years now, we've had um, from right across the whole of England, from Devon to Cheshire, Norfolk to Kent, hundreds of police being convicted of offences, including harassment, assault, criminal damage, theft and possession of firearms. So this is a national problem and it has contributed through the lack of leadership of this Conservative government, the lack of funding, the impact of the austerity cuts, which have led to disastrous consequences for people in this country, and it has led to a breakdown of the criminal justice system. You can regularly look on Twitter and see about courts and the ceilings falling down on people, and the leagues and the toilets that are in a state. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Um, it's time that the Tories properly funded the criminal justice system. And they should look to councils that are delivering for their residents, such as Hammersmith and Fulham. If we look at what we've delivered, we are, we are investing 5.5 million on CCTV to improve and grow the borough's 24-7 network of cameras. We have the largest law enforcement team with 72 let officers doing amazing and wonderful work. And we should thank them wholeheartedly. And we fund the gangs unit, including six police officers, who are working to help young people and make our streets safer. Our teams use the approach of engage, encourage, educate, 
and enforced to tackle crime and antisocial behaviour. We have a strong working relationship with the police in Hammersmith and Fulham, and we work closely with them to tackle crime and antisocial behaviour and to make the residents feel safer. The council supports the proactive measures that Hammersmith and Fulham Labour administration have taken to mitigate the damaging performance of this conservative government on crime and to make our streets safer. And we call on the government to do more and urge all councillors here tonight to support this motion. And I formally move it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, very interesting debates tonight. And I think it's just a sad indictment of the condition of our public services. They have deteriorated gradually, being eroded away, firstly, by years of Tory austerity and now the cost of living crisis. And we haven't even mentioned Brexit, which is another major contribution. It's hit communities like Hammersmith and Fulham really hard and across the UK. And it's because of appalling and I think often deliberate policy decisions by this Tory government. I find it quite amusing when we uh, heard a member of the opposition refer to the budget as the September fiscal event. <laughs> wow, we all know what he's talking about, but he obviously didn't want to say it. We've just heard uh, Councillor Harvey refer to some of the statistics, particularly around um, punishment and figures around sexual offences. And we've heard Councillor Coleman talk about how the NHS has been gradually eroded away under the government that we currently have. Our public services are broken and our crime and justice system is an example of how our communities are paying the price. Overall, police numbers are down. They're still down by four and a half percent since 2010. Hate crime is up by 26% just between 2020-21 and 21-22, just in one year, up 26%. Stabbings are now 60% higher than in 2015. And the number of violent criminals that are caught are at a record low. Recent figures show that half of communities, in, in half of communities, no burglaries, listen, no burglaries have been solved at all in three years. Burglaries during lockdown fell, but they're now on the way up again. And crime is 18% higher and prosecutions are 18% lower because the proportion of all crimes reaching court has plummeted to just 5.8%. We can talk about the stats, but they don't mean anything if you are a victim or if you have lost a loved one to violent crime. Gun crime, not an issue associated with the UK, but it seems to be making the headlines all too often with a number of shootings in Liverpool since the summer, including the murder of nine-year-old Olivia pratt Corbel, And at Christmas, a young woman lost her life on Christmas Eve shot dead whilst out celebrating. And in London, just last week, we had the drive-by shooting at a funeral in Euston, injuring six people, amongst them a seven-year-old girl who was critically injured and another 12-year-old girl. This isn't the UK that I recognise. Our system is broken. As councillors, we may, may not always be up to speed with the picture nat nationally, but like you, I have casework. I know that we all find really frustrating. Old and new councillors will be familiar with those frustrations of the antisocial behaviour cases that cannot be resolved because of delays in the court system. Equally frustrating is that many could have been prevented altogether if the right amount of mental health support for perpetrators or other support was available at the right time and the right place when it was really needed, all budgets and public services that have been squeezed. We need to tackle crime at its root and prevent it. We've just heard about some of the things that Ham, Smith and Fulham are doing. The gangs unit, that's policy for you. You want to debate policies about making things better, looking forward, just listen to what we have been doing. 
On a personal level, I'm very aware of a, a case between two young people, a sexual offence case, where both lives have been blighted, both the person that has been accused, it's been a massive strain, and on the victim, because it's taken three years to come to court. Both of those young people have got their lives blighted, and it really cannot go on. This is nat the, the national picture is gloomy. The picture is one of a broken Britain where public services are on their knees. That's simply not good enough for the country and it's simply not good enough for the residents of Hammersmith and Fulham. Please support our motion. I have been informed that Councillor Afonso wishes to speak. Madam Mayor, crime is up and nowhere is it higher than in Labour-run London. Overall, crime in Hammersmith and Fulham is 19% higher than the London average and 35% higher than the national average. This is for the year 2021, just in case you're going to fact check me. Under the failing Mayor Sadiq Khan, antisocial behaviour is up, drug offences are up and violence and sexual offences are up. On his watch, Knife crime has risen, including teenage homicides in the capital, with 30 lives tragically lost in 2021. The Mayor of London is the de facto Police and Crime Commissioner for London. On his shoulders alone falls the political burden for policing in our great capital. Londoners deserve better. And yet, while the Mayor seeks to extend his record of failure to a third term, the government is well on its way to delivering 20,000 new police officers. 1,708 of which have already joined the ranks of the Met. Under this administration, Madam Mayor, the overall crime rate in Hammersmith and Fulham for the year 2021 was 19% higher than the London average. On average, there were 103 crimes per 1,000 residents, as compared to 87 per 1,000 residents across London. Madam Mayor, my ward of Parsons, Green and Sandford has not been immune to this crime wave. In September, the police arrested a young male roaming Perrymead Street at 5 a.m., armed with a knife, no doubt hoping to catch someone returning from a night out. In July, a man on Chillingston Street was returning home from visiting the shops. In order to steal his watch, the criminals bashed his head in with a machete, resulting in 29 stitches. And recently, a man was robbed at gunpoint on Irene Road, walking to his house from his Uber. So while I welcome the introduction of the law enforcement team, it's clear these crimes will not be changing one fixed penalty notice at a time. Sadly, these stories merely reflect a snapshot of a more worrying picture. Burglary up 21%, antisocial behavior up 16%, vehicle crime up 13%. In Hammersmith and Fulham, the most common crimes are violence and sexual offenses. With 5,548 offences during 2021, 7% higher than the 2020 figure of 5,179. We are one of the youngest boroughs in London. We cannot allow Hammersmith and Fulham to become a place where young women feel afraid to walk home at night. Madam Mayor, under a Labour Council and a Labour Mayor, they have no one else to blame. Under their leadership, we are the fifth most dangerous borough in London. It's clear from their motion that this administration is out of ideas and out of appetite to tackle crime in the borough. Our residents deserve better. Are there any other speakers on this? Yes, Councillor Dinsmore. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, it is great to finally get the opportunity to speak on policing, uh, which is close to my heart. Uh, it'll not surprise you that I'm not going to enter into the debate about whether it's the national government's fault or whether it's Mayor Khan's fault. In my view, I don't think that's what we should be doing here. So I'm going to focus on the local impact that this crime wave is having. And then I want to briefly discuss the policy of the council and maybe suggest a different approach. As you all know, I was the victim of a machete attack in May last year. And unfortunately, I'm not alone. <clears throat> you may recall the tragic story of Hanny Solomon who was um, machete to death in February 2021 outside the White Horse pub in Fulham. I walk past the flowers, pinned to the light lamppost, celebrating his life every time I walk to the tube, and it is truly heartbreaking. That could have been me. It could have been any one of us. 
and it could have been one of our residents. Machete crime has risen sixfold in the last seven years. It was up 65% in the first seven months of 2022 in London alone. As a result, on the 15th of July, 2022, the Met Police issued an appeal in which they stated that in May and June, 2022, there have been 93 such incidents across Hammersmith, Fulham, Kensington, and Chelsea. That is over one incident a day. Unfortunately, things haven't improved since then. I won't repeat uh, the, the incidents that um, my uh, colleague, Councillor Afonso, has mentioned, but just to mention a few others. In August, a resident was assaulted in Bishop's Park for his watch and left with life-changing injuries. In September, a resident was violently assaulted walking through Bayonne Park in Fulham. On my own street over the summer, two people were arrested with machetes at midnight on a Saturday. My neighbour was told by the police they were waiting for residents to come home after socialising to mug them at knife point. Within a week of that incident, youths were arrested with machetes in Sands End. And just before Christmas, two people were attacked with a machete at Westfield, leading to the hospitalisation of one. The council's solution are law enforcement teams. I have spent time with the law enforcement teams. I commend the work that they do and have huge admiration and gratitude for the individuals that serve to protect our communities. However, the LETs simply don't have the powers, the training, nor the equipment to enforce the law against these violent criminals. In their own words, they can only act as a professional witness if a violent attack occurs. They cannot intervene to prevent it. In my view, the solution for the council is simple. They need more support from police officers. And I think from reading the motion, we actually agree on that. But the council's position is that it should come from either the Met or nationally. But I think there's something that we as a council can do about it. As to the costs of more police officers, the difference in starting salary between an LET and a police officer is a few thousand pounds. Whilst I accept that there may be increased costs of training police officers, that is an investment worth making in the safety of our community going forwards. I am delighted to say that I have worked constructively and cooperatively on the Social Inclusion and Community Safety Policy and Accountability Committee with Councillors Suslis, Miri, Campbell-Simon and Taylor to find joint solutions to problems facing the borough. We have found a way to put poli politics to one side and pull in the same direction for our residents, and I thank my fellow councillors for that. But I implore the leader of the council to do the same. Do not politicise this issue into Labour's solution of LETs and the Conservative solution of more police officers. There is a third way, which is a blend of both. Having LETs, but also having more police officers so they can work together to support the community and to tackle violent crime. The consequences of getting this policy wrong are not only life changing, at times they can tragically be life ending. Please reconsider this policy carefully. Thank you. Are there any other speakers on this motion? Sorry? Yes. Madam Mayor, thank you. My two pre previous colleagues, Lisa Homan and Rebecca Harvey, have spoken already with passion and sincerity on this subject, and I, I don't want to re replicate that. I want to focus on the part of the motion which deals with the underfunding of the criminal justice system and the impact it has on the legal profession. As a solicitor of some years standing, I thought that I ought to have, say a few words on that subject with my personal knowledge. Unfortunately, Dominic Raab, the justice secretary uh, at the time, who was then sacked by Liz Truss and has been reinstated by his mate, who is now the Prime Minister of this country, has not taken this matter very seriously. He must realize that the underfunding of the legal criminal system is, a, is, is in a crisis as bad as the NHS and is a matter which cannot be resolved by a sneer or a laugh, but by facts and by facts and results. 
Now let us look at the facts. The Conservative government frequently asserts that it is the pandemic that caused this back, the backlog of criminal cases in Crown and Magistrates Courts. But the backlog was soaring long before March 2020. Delays in the court system were endemic years before we'd even heard of COVID-19. Since the Conservatives have been in office over the last 12 years, they have, were, they were in excess of 38,000 outstanding cases in courts. Since 2020, this has already doubled. There are now 16,000 cases outstanding in London's Crown Courts and nearly 73,000 cases in the Magistrates Court, making a grand total of 89,000 cases. The average wait time for criminal prosecution has risen to 708 days. The government estimates that it will get the backlog down to 53,000 cases by March 2025, which in my view is fanciful. Over the last 12 years under the Conservative government, the legal profession has become a profession of silent onlookers. They have remained silent despite the massive legal aid funding cuts and despite the fact that the junior barristers were earning less than the minimum wage they have remained silent due to the hostility of the Conservative ministers, especially the Minister of Finance, Dominic Raab, who has failed to understand uh, the, the gravity of the situation despite being a lawyer himself. They have also remained silent despite the inadequate facilities at court with, reef, with leaking roofs and no heating. And they have remained silent and participated in the process to get things going. But one day in June, 2022, the profession decided that they were not going to take it any longer. For the first time in its history, they went on a strike. It was one of the most amazing things I've seen in my life. Barristers, including Queen's Council in wigs and gowns, demonstrating outside our courts, holding placards. They realized that it was now time to stand up for justice even under the threat by be, of being reported to their professional bodies. They realized that they had to stand up for righteousness for people who were eligible for legal aid and who still were denied justice. They realized that they had to stand up and take the consequences which always follow when you break the majesty of the law with fines and reprimands for non appearances at trial by trial judges. Dominic Raab, with his arrogance, failed to negotiate with these lawyers. And the strike went on for four months from June till October 2007. It was ultimately settled by his successor, who, who was in office for 40 days uh, as, as, as same, same period as Liz Truss. It is now necessary for this government to tackle the pressing problems with the urgency of time. The criminal justice system has been underfunded for more than a decade and needs to be dealt with by the Conservatives as a matter of urgency. We need more dedicated Nightingale, Nightingale courts focused on long-standing cases to clear the backlog. We also need investment to pay for staff, to pay the staff competitive salaries and employ enough people to cut down waiting lists. Finally, uh, I would say that I'm proud of the fact that despite these spending cuts, the Hammersmith and Fulham Law Center, of which I'm a proud member, and the Hammersmith and Fulham Citizens Advice Bureau have remained open and served the residents of this borough. This has been fully supported by the Labour Group. It is only when the criminal system, police system, justice system, including the police, is properly maintained and adequately funded that all residents of this borough will keep safe and protected and feel will feel safe and protected and can enjoy what one eminent statement Thomas Jefferson described was the purpose of life, which is to enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thank you, Matt. I would now invite the leader of the council to speak. Um, yeah, I, I want to make it very clear that nobody 
anybody, anywhere, should be the victim of crime. Crime is untenable. It is the symptom of a failed criminal who's a failed individual. And it's a symptom of a failed society when crime goes up. And when you look at those societies that most work in the world, crime is low. When you look at those societies that are most dysfunctional in the world, crime is through the roof. And it's not political to say that over the last 13 years, crime has shot up in the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And it has, and it's gone up and up and up as other factors in society have gone down and down and down. Now, I'm not one of those leading heart liberals that think that all we've got to do is to reform the criminals. But I, and I absolutely think we have to crack down hard on criminals. But I would like to have a society that doesn't have criminals, doesn't produce people who commit crime, whether it's blue collar crime or white collar crime or any type of crime. The fact is, Britain is broken by what's happened to this country in recent years. I was shocked to see on the 16th of January, 2022, country file featuring as its headline item, not the stuff it normally does, but how organized crime is now operating in rural communities across Britain. Um, how county lines gangs are co-opting people into uh, hardened crime. Now our view is we will tackle the causes of crime and we will crack down hard on crime. And that's why we have done many things to protect people in society and divert them on a different path. And as Gideon Springer or Chief Superintendent Gideon Springer, as he was better known to many of us said, when he first came into office and I offered him the largest amount of council funded fund, uh, funding for policing that ever happened in the, in the history of a borough. I mean, he took the money, but he urged me to put it into youth centers and to other activities, uh, which we also did. So we are building a 118 million pound youth center, state of the art youth center in uh, White City. We, are, we did save youth centers that had been uh, scheduled to be sold off under the former conservative administration. And we objected when I was leader of the opposition to the Castle Club and other clubs that got sold off in Sanzen, which was quoted, which had been a hub of youth activity. And there are many other factors. But the fact is, you have to stop the crime. But anyone who knows anything, and I'm deeply sorry to hear the deputy leader has had such a traumatic attack. I'm sorry that happened to you. But it's not political to say that we put a law enforcement team on, on place. We were funding the largest amounts of uh, police funded uh, police officers in, in history. And when they were merged with Westminster, guess where they went? And we could not track them. We could not track where they were. And when it became obvious that we were putting two million pounds into policing, and we said, what would happen if we cut that, any of that money? They said, we wouldn't cut it. We've cut it to the bone already. It became very clear that the internal structures in the policing did not allow us to track the police officers, the 48 extra police officers that we were paying for. So we've done two things. We put law enforcement officers onto the street who have nearly all the powers of a police officer. They are the eyes and ears of the borough. They gather intelligence. They hold the police to account as our partners, and they work side by side with the police in targeting criminal activity. But that is not, as the deputy leader said, the council's solution. Law enforcement teams aren't the solution. They are part of a much wider solution. Now, Kieran Dalliwell, who was an amazing officer who worked for this council, came to see me when she was working as one of two people in the gangs unit. And she said to me, Steve, thing is, they won't ever let us increase the gangs units what is needed. So I was like, what's needed? And she went, we need 33. And we should do it in conjunction with the police, like me and Pat do, she said. And I went, what do you mean they won't let us? She went, the council won't let us. I went, I'm the leader of the council. So we've now got 33 gangs units in partnership with the police that goes after criminals. In fact, in its first two months in office, it took out 600 county line gang people across the country. It's a major success. So successful, the police officer who helped me introduce it, use it to get promoted as in, in part of their job interview, she later told me in a later thing. But the biggest reason you catch criminals is with CCTV. And that's why we've got Britain's largest amount of CCTV anywhere. And we're putting more in, as my colleague, uh, the cabinet member said. So let's be very clear. This Labour administration will crack down on the causes of crime. It will crack down on crime. It will prioritise spending 
And if people are serious about wanting to know more about how that works, I'm happy to brief them. But a lot of what's been said on these benches is factually wrong. And I think if they knew more, they would be much more supportive of our strategy. Are there any other speakers on this motion? In that case, I call on Councillor Harvey to sum up. Um, so just, just to sum up really, um, just taking the point about crime in Hammersmith and Fulham, I, I attend a community safety partnership meeting and look at all the reports and I don't recognise what I've heard here this evening. It, it just doesn't even hit on the radar. Um, in terms of a national problem, it feels like there is anarchy in this country. It feels like just it's just crazy. I went to um, RBKC to go rock climbing last year and within a week on three separate occasions, I was harassed, followed, um, approached, um, people in my, a, a man in my face. It was absolutely horrendous. And that was in a conservative borough. Um, and no one should have to put up any crime, as we all agree, I believe. Um, just to touch on the policy change, as the leader rightly said, you know, we funded police and it didn't work for us. When there are problems in, and the way the BCU works, and it's clear people don't seem to understand it, but when um, there are riots or protests in RBKC or Westminster, all those police just <laughs> go over there and we lose them. So, you know, how do we benefit? How do our residents benefit that if we're putting our money into something we can't even use? So that's not a great use of our money, our resources. They just flow over there. Um, if officers are sick, we have no control over it. So we have an amazing LAT team. They are fully trained as those that sit on a PAC committee will know. They are highly trained officers. Residents really appreciate them being around and being available. Um, and our gangs unit are doing amazing work preventing um crime working with residents last week i was actually at a community group with the gangs unit and residents talking about some issues and how things had changed since they've been involved and how happy they were so it just shows you that if you take an approach like what we're doing in Hampshire from fulham you can make a real difference to people's lives and it's not just community safety um section that's doing amazing work and our officers there but also just looking at children's services um and who recently um, received a youth justice outstanding from HMIP inspectorate report led by Councillor Sanderson and the strategic director, Jackie McShannon. So absolutely amazing achievement. You know, we're, we're doing so much. And as you heard from the leader, we're investing 180 million pounds in youth center as well. You know, as we know, police numbers are down. We've had 4.5% are down and only 5.8% of the cases are reaching courts. I mean, it's a disgrace. And this is all under a conservative government who likes to say that they're all about law and order. Well, clearly that is not the case. Um, so I would just conclude by saying that, you know, um, when things are dysfunctional and you've got a dysfunctional government, you certainly have high crime and we can all see it. Um, it's clearly underfunded criminal justice system. This has been going on for a decade under austerity, and it really is time, um, you know, the government actually stood up and put its money into the system to properly fund it. So I call on everyone to support this motion tonight and formally move it. Is the motion agreed? In that case, I'll put the motion to the vote. Those in favor? Those against? Those not voting? The motion is carried. And we can now move to special motion six, risk to the voting rights from conservative photo identification requirement. I call on Councillor Kwon and Walsh to move and second. Formally moved. Formally seconded. Councillor Kwon. Thank you, Mayor. 
So I'd like to make it clear from the start that uh, we're not moving this motion because we're against the concept of proving that you are eligible to vote. In fact, I think proving that you're eligible to vote is very important because you have to have confidence in your election system. You have to, in, in the integrity of your election system for uh, democracy to really flourish. The thing is we already run checks on ID to vote. We are really good at running elections in this country. This voter ID scheme, which is being rushed through currently is a barrier to vote scheme. As we all know, in the UK, there isn't a formal mandatory national identity scheme. Now, it's not the time to discuss that, um, but we're asking our citizens and residents to produce ID that a lot of residents don't actually carry. Um, there isn't, you know, it's a backward way. If we had a national ID scheme, asking people to prove their identity wouldn't be a problem because it's something that they would intrinsically have. As it stands, what's going to happen is uh, there's going to be confusion and frustration at our polling stations uh, and voters, our voters, our residents are going to be turned away when they turn up to vote. Now, there's evidence from around the world that proves that voter ID schemes disproportionately disadvantage already marginalised groups. You just have to look at the United States to see that. In particular, young people are going to be affected in this country. The two most frequently uh, used forms of uh, ID currently uh, are passport and driving licenses. The problem is, if you're 18, just turned 18, you may not have your own passport. And even applying for one is difficult. Anyone who's tried uh, to get a passport in the last couple of years uh, from the uh, Home Office, including myself, uh, I think probably has you know, little to no faith in the way that the government uh, issues ID. And the fact is that uh, a driving license, you need to pass your driving test to uh, actually get one. On average, 25, 35 pounds an hour, uh, 45 hours lessons on average, uh, no one is going to spend, I presume, over £1,500 uh, and months of their life just to get ID in order to vote. Now, if you look at the list of uh, other alternative forms of ID included in the scheme, they're all skewed towards people who are older and not younger in the 18 to 24 bracket. Now, I think a lot of us know uh, as activists that it's sometimes really difficult to get residents engaged in the democratic process. So what we're doing with this scheme is putting that barrier in front of them and disenfranchising them. And it's not actually those who don't have ID. Even people who have ID will inevitably forget to bring it when they come to vote because it's a big change to the way we run our uh, elections. Now, the government has trialed this uh, scheme in 2018 and 2019 in the English local elections. Now, in both years, the participating councils required voters to bring a form of photo ID. And uh, over both sets of pilot, over 1,000 people who turned up to vote and were turned away did not come back to vote after being turned away. So even if you have the ID, if you forget it, which people will do, I mean, we have uh, elections due in London next year. Um, if, if this voter ID scheme, which currently is just for the May elections coming up, if that's extended, that will be thousands of our voters who may be turned away, who may not come back to vote. And the thing is, there's no evidence that this voter ID scheme is needed. As I said, we run elections really well. There are extremely low levels of electoral fraud and people, of, of this country have a really high confidence in our voting system. The Electoral Commission, the independent watchdog, uh, actually uh, did a public uh, study this year in February. 80% of people are confident that elections have run well. 87% said that voting is safe from fraud and abuse. And 90% uh, that voting at the polling station is safe. Now, the Independent Electoral Commission has wrote a letter to the government in the summer of 2022 saying that advising for this scheme to be delayed, it's not fully secure, they said, and it's not workable. And then the Local Government Association, which represents local authorities of every single political administration and colour across the country, has also called 
for a delay to the introduction of these changes. And yet, for some reason, the government is storming ahead with it for this May. Um, and also, uh, let's not forget the cost. Uh, the government's own numbers say that this is likely to cost over £180 million over the next decade for something where uh, in uh, 2019, uh, general election, there were 33 allegations Councilor of impersonation. Bond, begin okay. So, um, yeah, it's... Even if there was a discussion to be had about this, I don't understand why it's being pushed through within the next few months. Thank you. Councillor Walsh. Thank you, Mayor. I want to start with a reference to our May election that just passed. It's an election that we all partook in and elected this very chamber. Residents throughout Hammersmith and Fulham turned out, cast their votes, and they had confidence in the result. It ultimately, the reason we all sit here today is because of that election. And that election, just like many other elections up and down this country, are elections that people have confidence in. And that is very much represented in the turnout in elections as well. At the last two general elections, in 2019, 673 the 2017 election, 68.8. These are high turnouts, and it reflects the true confidence that people have that they are taking part in a democratic system that works. Now, I cannot understand why we need to bring in this election act. <coughs> Levels of impersonation or election fraud, as referenced by Councillor Kwan, are incredibly low. And looking at this act, the forms of ID seem particular and very selective. The over 60s Oyster card, yes, but the 18 plus Oyster card, no. Most forms of student ID, no. Bank statements, no. Rail cards, no. Members here will be well aware that there was a motion tabled from the House of Lords to greatly expand the number of forms of ID that could be accepted when people went to cast their vote. But it is with profound regret that the Conservative government made the decision to veto that amendment. This will have a disproportionate effect on many people. And I am deeply concerned that it will have an effect, particularly on our younger people. Looking at the turnout amongst the 18 to 24 age group at the general election in 2019, this is about 47%. We all know on both sides of this uh, chamber, the need to get younger people engaged in the democratic process. Creating new barriers is not going to do that. As referenced by Councillor Kwan, the cost behind many forms of these IDs are abhorrent and simply unattainable to many young people. And this is also true of those who are in uh, difficult financial situations, who will struggle to be able to provide the forms of ID. I know there is this voter authority certificate, but I must question the use of public money to fund something that is so unnecessary. As I say, our democratic process in this country is highly effective. Levels of fraud are so low, and I must question the use of public money in this way. The additional cost of, and the use of public money in the training of staff, the extra equipment that's going to be needed to, uh, to check at IDs, it's just such a waste. Public money needs to be dealt with properly, and I cannot believe that this is what taxpayers' money is being used for. I really believe that this scheme needs to be scrapped. It's unnecessary, it's expensive, and it's wholeheartedly undemocratic. I encourage all members who believe in a free, fair, liberal democracy to support this motion tonight. Thank you very much.
I have been informed that Councillor Holder, Councillor Brockerbank Fowler, Councillor Shavot Verdier, and Councillor Carmel wish to speak. We can begin with Councillor Holder. Thank you, Mayor. Risk to voting rights from conservative voter IT requirements is another example of the hostile environment towards migrants who live here, who pay taxes here, and simply want to vote here. Like many whose families migrated to Britain, as a black British national, I'm actually embarrassed by this Tory government to call myself British. Voting is a fundamental right, but this government is intent on making it a privilege to do those things with voter ID. Today, I will address why we need to be combating the huge challenges that undermine our democracy, not putting up paywalls around beholding stations. This decision to implement voter ID is not for the integrity of a well-functioning electoral system, but to exclude those from the margins of society. We have seen a consistent and calculated attack on black, minority ethnic and migrant individuals by this government. The Windrush scandal being one such example, highlighting what happens when those who lack voter ID are shut out democratically. As a black disabled councillor, I deplore the Conservatives commitment to fostering a hostile environment towards minority groups and migrants. The Conservative government's insistence on the use of voter ID in the name of electoral integrity is nothing short of a farce. It's plainly a significant risk to voting rights. Not only will it disenfranchise many, but it places an initial burden on local authorities to deliver a democratic vote at a time with limited funded funding and limited resources. The incident of a person voter fraud are extremely rare. There have, there have just two convictions, there have, sorry, there has just been two convictions of voter fraud over the past five years, which many calls into question its intent. This legislation significantly weakens rights and protections and domestic law, allowing this government to bar millions of pe people from exercising their democratic right. Given that an estimated 3.5 million people do not carry any form of voter ID. These voter, sorry, this voter suppression tactics are a direct attack on the young and the marginalized taken straight from the Republican playbook, a partisan strategy to suppress democratic votes. The electronic, sorry, the Electoral Commission to 2021 data found that 90% of the public consider voting to be safe from fraud at the polling station. There is no doubt that the decision to implement voter identification is not solely for the integrity of the well-functioning of the electoral system itself and poses a significant risk to voter rights in the UK, which is clearly what this scheme has been designed to do. Rather than putting up barriers to democracy, like my colleagues, I urge the government and colleagues across in the opposition to advise their colleagues to scrap its proposed voter identification scheme and end their voter suppression tactics. Thank you. Councillor 
Councillor Brocklebank Fowler. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I believe this is a disingenuous motion. In the first paragraph, it's asserted that plans to introduce photo ID for voters has been hurried. This is clearly not the case, as this issue has been discussed for over 20 years. In fact, the last, and I mean that in both senses, Labour government under Tony Blair introduced this very requirement in Northern Ireland in 2003. I can quote from their ministerial statement. The government have no intention of taking away people's democratic right to vote. If we believe that thousands of voters would not be able to vote because of this measure, we would not be introducing it. Furthermore, Eric Pickles recommended the introduction of voter ID in 2015. This came after local elections when a court judgment was upheld following election corruption in Tower Hamlets. It was also in the 2019 Conservative Manifesto. The Electoral Commission and the Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe have also recommended that voter ID be implemented. The purpose of this new requirement is primarily to prevent personification. The current system is open to abuse as, a vo as voters need only supply their name and address. Many of our European residents who vote in our local elections are shocked by the lack of identity checks. Voter ID is mandatory in France and elsewhere in Europe. The elections bill also contains other measures which have already been extensively consulted. A few examples being stopping postal and proxy vote fraud by banning postal vote harvesting on doorsteps strengthening the law against intimidation and undue influence and preventing foreign interference and closing loopholes to dodge third party spending limits. As to the practicalities of the policy for voters, all electors will be notified about the new photo requirement by poll card before an election. The poll card will increase in size from A5 to A4 and be in an envelope. It will have all the details about what form of ID is acceptable, and there are 23 qualifying documents. This includes a broad range, such as passports, driving licenses, concessionary travel passes, and blue badge documents. In addition, expired forms of these types of identification will be acceptable if the photo is a good enough likeness. Government data published by the Cabinet Office in 2021 shows that 98% of electors already have one of the acceptable documents. I would like to take this breakdown further. 98% of people who identify as white, 99% of people from an ethnic minority background, including 99% of 18 to 29 year olds, and 98% of those aged 70 and over. If a voter does not have an acceptable form of photo document, then one will be issued for them by local councils at no cost to the voter. As an interesting aside, when the Cabinet Office evaluated the identification pilot scheme in 2019, they found that locally issued identification had a positive benefit for homeless electors who were able to use it to access other local public services, including a job centre. Nowadays, photo ID is required in many areas, areas of life, for example, for security in office buildings, such as this one, buying a TfL travel card, and interestingly enough, for the administration to attend their own party conference. In order to keep costs down, extra provisions have been made for electoral services. During uh, general election years, all polling stations will have funding for an extra poll clerk to facilitate photographic um, identification checks. There will be more training, extra equipment to sensitively check identification, such as a privacy screen, and electoral registration officers will have funding to purchase a digital camera so that they can take a photo of the elector for their voter authority certificate, if one is necessary. My comments throughout this speech are not a criticism of how our LBHF electoral services department is run. On the contrary, 
I would like to praise and thank Zoe Wilkins and her team for their efficiency and integrity. Sadly, however, cases of voting abuse are highlighted elsewhere in the country at election times. The foundation of our democracy lies in our right to vote in elections that are transparent, fair, secure and modern and the introduction of photo ID is an important part of this. We will be voting against your motion. Thank you, Mayor. Um, in the interest of transparency, I wanted to emphasize that I work for a digital technology company, but that I checked um, with our services whether there was any conflict of interest and it's been cleared. And colleagues, in the interest of the quality of the debate, I'll say that France has been mentioned, the homeland, yes, mandatory uh, voter ID, but also a free identity card scheme provided to all citizens. Now, last time I spoke about how the Tory government were refusing to reform the Local Government Act to reap the full potential of the UK tech industry and how that further excluded underrepresented groups from our democracy. So today I will instead speak about how Tory governments are refusing to reform the Elections Act to reap the full potential of the UK tech industry and how that will further exclude underrepresented groups um, from society. Now, they wanted the policy proposal. Let's give them one, shall we? The Act ignores new technologies like digital identity. It is absurd as the pass card, which will be accepted, also comes in a digital format, which provides a higher level of assurance that the person holding it is who they say they are. And digital driver's licenses are becoming a global norm. And recent studies show more people in this country own a smartphone than a passport or driver's license. And people with a digital identity can now complete a range of regulated activities, such as buying age-restricted products or completing a DBS check. So why not voting? People could create their voter ID at home and for free. The UK has a mature tech sector, which you're ignoring, and a healthy ecosystem of government certified digital identity providers so it is well-versed to become a democracy, a digital democracy. But because smartphones are more common amongst younger people, it is obvious the list is designed to favour the Tory party's perceived target demographics. But if you ask me, thanks to their performance tonight, there'll be a smaller group than when the meeting began. <laughs> and the voter authority certificate is just one more way. The Tory government is defaulting on its duty to ensure people can vote regardless of wealth. It passes that responsibility and the cost onto local authorities. <clears throat> local authorities then have a choice between letting the most vulnerable down or picking up the bill. And after a decade of cuts in grants and public services, many are on the brink, with of course the richest faring better and the poorest doing ever worse, deepening territorial equality in our country. It's essentially a pyramid scheme where the government introduces a requirement to possess something it has a monopoly on, takes in all the extra profits, but passes the cost on of providing a free version to local authorities. It's beyond creative accountancy, it's financial bullying. The government has also failed to tackle the tidal wave of fake documents, with some available online for as little as 25 pounds, including postage, and that's cheaper from getting it from the DVLA itself. <laughs> so how will clerks check whether documents, cryptographic safety features are genuine? Are they familiar with New Zealand passports? Verification technology via RFID chip read can provide a high level of assurance, which the human eye, even if it is trained to UK border force level, simply cannot match. <laughs> clerks will also have to make extremely subjective decisions about whether a person looks enough like a picture. People living with vitiligo alopecia, cancer, trans people, or those with visible differences will be at risk of exclusion because a condition may have changed how they look. A, register should, a registered check, pardon me, should not require disclosing a disability in public. It should be a simple, factual, yes or no check of a claimed data-minimized identity against a database. 
The government has based unrealistic duties on the untrained clerks, which will lead to exclusion and people wrongly turned away and unnecessary personal information disclosures. I do not have enough time to say all the ways I hate this act. It's sort of just the government's strategy is that if people won't vote for them anymore, then they may as well not vote. In just a few months, they will have stifled our freedom of speech with the online safety bill, ended our data protection regime with the data protection bill, weakened environmental protection and food standards with the retain EU law bill, taken away our right to strike with the strikes bill and attacked our democracy head on with the elections act at a time when democracy is facing autocracy on the battlefields of Europe. What a disgraceful legacy they will leave behind. I sincerely hope one day they can forgive themselves because we will not. I've been informed that Councillor Jones wishes to speak. Uh, many thanks. Madam Mayor. Um, so I want to follow on from that last speech because I'm very disappointed with the opposition's view of this. And there are a few things in a nutshell that I think I would like to convey uh, to the council tonight. When we encounter bad policy, I think we all need to recognize it. And we've often heard in this chamber room of the threats there are to democracy. And very simply put, for whatever reason, this is really bad policy. And I would actually say to the opposition that nobody in this room, if we think about the state of democracy globally, should be supporting this policy as it stands at the moment, for whatever reason it is conceived. And we heard, of course, about the history of discussions about photo ID in voting from 20 years ago. Quite a lot of things have happened in the last 20 years in terms of evidence of what happens when you introduce this kind of system. And the simple, as several of my colleagues have expressed, the simple reality is you disenfranchise voters. Fewer people, for whatever reason, are able to or do vote. Now, we can have a long discussion about the infinite list of forms of voter, photographic ID that you might be able to provide. But as somebody said, if you've talked to a lot of 18 year olds recently, they're not going to be very interested. They're not very interested in participating as a group demographically in our democracy at the moment. They see lots of barriers. And what we're doing in this piece of legislation is, is introducing a whole load more disincentives to participating in something that is very fragile and under threat globally. Now, I was having a read before of what the Electoral Reform Society has to say on this, which is, in summary, a disenfranchising disaster. And, by the way, as several people said, a complete waste of £180 million of taxpayers' money. Because as a piece of bad policy, it isn't going to work. And as the previous speech just articulated, um, and as you may not be aware, it is extremely easy to fraudulently create photographic ID. So we're dealing with a piece of legislation that disenfranchises a huge number of people, young people, disabled people, people from uh, of diverse backgrounds, and which doesn't succeed in achieving any of its policy objectives, because you can actually, in fact, if you are seeking to get around it, easily get around the regulation you're introducing. And the previous speech articulated where we should be at if we are serious in a piece of policy about voter ID, which would not disenfranchise this large proportion of the population. Now, if you don't believe me, and as, as, as several councils have expressed, there is a huge amount of evidence, data and material from the US, from across the world that shows how this kind of intervention is ineffective. It is a waste of money. And it is a threat to our democracy, because as you may have noticed around the world, and has been said many times by others here, democracy is not exactly doing well globally. And we in Britain are seen as a beacon of a, 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 a proud, historic, liberal democracy. This is a retrograde step 
There is no cause to support it. The government may feel they're doing something right, and it is a big, dangerous mistake. The last thing we need to be doing in the world today, and as a democracy that is a beacon of democracy across the planet, is taking this inappropriate, disenfranchising policy. And I don't mean this actually particularly in a party political way, because I do understand the historic debates about electoral fraud. But if you look at the evidence, there isn't really any significant electoral fraud. This policy isn't going to address a problem because there isn't a significant problem. And we always hear whenever anybody talks about it, they come out with about two examples in the last 20 years, which are relatively minor. So this, in the big picture, is a threat to our well-admired democracy. It is a mistake. It isn't going to work. It's a waste of taxpayers' money. And there are better, if you actually wanted to do what this policy seeks to do in the next decade of the 21st century, there are far more sophisticated and effective ways of achieving uh, what you want to do in a policy objective without disenfranchising a huge number of people in our very fragile democracy globally and in this country. Thank you very much. Councillor Carmel. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm grateful. Um, I'll, looking at the time, I shall try and be as brief as possible. There are two parts of this motion that I, I actually agree or commend with. Uh, the first is I'd like to echo the words of uh, Councillor Brocklebank Fowler as, and state my admiration for our current uh, electoral services team. And secondly, I commend the administration for undertaking to ensure, to do all that they can to ensure that everybody is able to vote. And I think something you will have our full support on. But in our current electoral system, there is inexcusable potential for someone to cast another's vote at the polling station. Now, I think probably only Councillor Harcourt, as a member of the administration, will remember the case of Thompson versus Dan and another in re a local government election, Eelbrook Ward, London Borough of Hammersmith and Fulham, Queen's Bench Division 3, November 1994, which resulted in a hearing in the Queen's Remembrances. Uh, chambers in, uh, in the Royal Courts of Justice and a, a full two-day hearing as well before two senior judges, all about one vote where somebody came along in Eelbrook Ward to try and cast the vote, only to be told that somebody had already cast it before them. The estimated cost of that one vote Back in 1994, when money went a, lot, a long way, it was over £200,000 for just one vote. But um, the motion also goes on to say that uh, youth are going to be disenfranchised, as again, as Councillor Brocklebank Fowler has uh, referenced, IFF research, which is the gold standard of research, which has been used by governments of both parties since 1965 found that actually the percentage of the population with the highest qualifying uh, percentage of having the appropriate ID that will be required is the 18 to 29 year olds, 99%. Also talk has been made about the voter authority certificates um, and references made to the costs. However, the cabinet office has agreed that not only will the costs on the electoral services teams up and down the country be covered by them directly, but also the costs of implementation as well. So to claim that it's going to damage hard pressed local government budgets is, um, I'm afraid, a misnomer. Data from the pilot evaluations in both 2018 and 2019 show that the requirement to show identification has increased voter confidence in the process. Increasing voter confidence in the process. We want every voter to have full confidence and anything that will increase the confidence is a good thing. Ah, sorry, I'm running out of time. 
Sharing identification to prove who they are is something people of all walks of life already do every day. It is a reasonable and proportionate approach to extend this practice to voting and to give the public the confidence that their vote is their vote and theirs alone. If the public are more confident in the democratic system, they're more likely to participate in it. Data again from the pilot evaluations show that the requirement to show identification include, increased the voter confidence. Many European countries, not just France, already require um, voter identification. As well as France, we've got Germany, Austria, the Netherlands, and even Switzerland, that hotbed of criminality. Not as has already been referenced. It was a Labour government that brought in voter ID for Northern Ireland in 2003. I didn't see you storming the barricades to try and prevent that from happening. <laughs> Everyone who is entitled to vote must and will be able to do so under the legislation. But there are other positives with this. As well as steps to increase protection, the election bills includes wider measures to make our polls more inclusive, such as extending the list of people who can support disabled people to vote at polling stations and requiring returning officers to consider the needs of voters with a wide range of disability. My time is nearly up now. We think that increasing voter confidence is a good thing. We think ensuring that everybody has the right to vote who's entitled to vote is a good thing, and we will be opposing this motion. Thank you. In light of the time, I'll call upon Councillor Con to sum up. I'll say it again. We're very good at elections in this country, but I will add we're also very good at elections in Hammersmith and Fulham. Now, both uh, the leader of the opposition and Councillor Carmel have said that the government have promised to fund the uh, changes to, to uh, the electoral process. The problem is they're funding it to their standards, not ours. So as of today, the government has, we, there's no allocated budget, for example, for a publicity campaign for us to educate the voters of our borough on the changes. So if, if you know, we've got just over a year left, if these changes were to come in for the London and assembly elections next year, usually our electoral uh, services contact residents and start checking on voting some before an election. We don't have any money to contact residents to inform them of this change, but that money would be come out of our budget. So I don't trust the government's standards for how they're going to run this. It's, it just it doesn't meet our standards. Now, um, I suspect that the um, or that now uh, the leader of the opposition was talking about how lots of people wouldn't wouldn't be disenfranchised to vote. The problem is thousands won't vote if you put a barrier in front of them. I suspect that she secretly harbours some of these fears because quoting her from May and the election, she said that residents uh, um, uh, don't like changes, uh, that the changes to the ward boundaries had unsettled them. People do not like change. Now, she wasn't talking about voting, I know, she was talking about the ward boundaries, but this is a humongous change to the way we vote, and it's going to have, I suspect, we all, re we all know that this will have an effect on turnout, people being turned away and coming back. Now, again, repeating, there were 33 allegations of impersonation at the polling station in 2019 against the 58 million votes that were cast. So I'm not a statistician, but I believe that's negligible. Um, so, I mean, overall, it's bad policy. It hasn't been rushed through. And even those organisations, independent organisations like the Love Local Government Association and the Electoral Commission, who, who aren't opposing it, are asking for a delay. So, even uh, those people who aren't against it do not understand why it's uh, coming through. Someone mentioned the gold standard. The gold standard of changing electoral law internationally is that you do not bring in a law that changes electoral policy in under a year. And that is what's happened here. So once again, the, the Conservative government is dragging us below international standards. Therefore, I would urge everyone to support my motion. <laughs> Is the motion agreed? The motion to a vote. Those in favour?
Those against? Those not voting? The motion is carried. The guillotine has now fallen. All the motions published and the amendment circulated at the beginning of the meeting are hereby moved. Yeah, yeah. The guillotine has now fallen. One of four. The guillotine fell at one of four. So we circulated at uh, 10 or 2. So we're in time. All the motions published and the amendments circulated, circulated in the meeting are hereby moved and seconded. Special motion seven. Is it withdrawn? Oh, oh. Yeah, that's true. That's Mayor, I, I believe that is my motion. <laughs> Special motion one then. Uh, withdrawn? Special motion Special motion one, special motion two. In that case, that is the end of tonight's meeting. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Now, I was uh, I think very much that. That was quite exciting, actually. And it was like a thing. So, like, you know, like, uh, I think it's. Uh, uh,